Honourable Members, the Speaker. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament. Direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> the Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, I ask the Leader of the House to move a motion relating to the routine of business for the sitting. His leave, leave is granted. Uh, I thank the House. I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the routine of business for this sitting being, unless otherwise ordered, a motion to be moved by the Prime Minister relating to terrorist attacks in the United States of America. Questions that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Prime Minister. Mr uh, Speaker, um, I move that this House, one, expresses its horror at the terrorist attacks which have claimed so many lives in the United States of America. Two, conveys to the government and the people of the United States the deepest sense of sympathy and shared loss felt by the government and people of Australia. Three, extends condolences to the families and other loved ones of those Australians killed or missing as a result of the attacks. Four, declares that such attacks represent an assault not only on the people and the values of the United States of America, but of free societies everywhere. Five, praises the courageous efforts of those engaged in the dangerous rescue operation still underway. Six, believes that the terrorist attacks in New York City and Washington, D.C constitute an attack upon the United States of America within the meaning of Articles 4 and 5 of the ANZUS Treaty. 7. Fully endorses the commitment of the Australian Government to support, within Australia's capabilities, United States-led action against those responsible for these tragic attacks. And finally, encourages all Australians in the wake of these appalling events to display those very qualities of tolerance and inclusion which the terrorists themselves have assaulted with such awful consequences. Yeah. Mr Speaker, in the 27 years that I have been privileged to be a member of this parliament, I can think of no more sombre occasion than the circumstances under which this House meets today. We have had tragedies of a national and international kind before. We have been touched by the poignancy of the deaths of people. We have confronted significant moral and national challenges. But none matches in depth and scale and magnitude the consequences of what the world must now do in response to the terrible events in the United States last week. In sheer scale, the death and destruction is almost incomprehensible in a time not regarded as a time of war. It would appear, Mr Speaker, that more than double the number of Americans who died at Pearl Harbor have died in New York City and Washington as a result of these terrorist attacks. The death toll could easily be more than the entire American battle losses on the first day of the Normandy invasion in June of 1944. They dwarf, of course, the terrible loss inflicted by Timothy McMay's 
McVeigh's act of madness on the federal building in Oklahoma some six or seven years ago. So it is in every sense, Mr Speaker, a tragedy and an obscenity of an appalling and repugnant magnitude. But it goes beyond the death so cruelly inflicted without warning, without justification, without any skerrick of moral authority on innocent people merely going about their daily lives. But its context represents a massive assault on the values not only of the United States of America, but also on the values of this country, the values of free men and women and of decent people and decent societies around the world. It is an act um, of terror. It is an act which is repugnant, Mr Speaker, to all of the things that we as a society believe in. And on occasions like this, those things that divide us in this parliament, those things that we might bicker and quarrel over as a people as we go about our lives are so suddenly and so quickly put into perspective. I remember the morning in Washington, as the House knows, I'd been in the United States. I'd been for an early morning walk. It was a beautiful Washington morning. There was just a touch of autumn. I'd walked past the Lincoln Memorial and many of the other great memorials of that great nation which stood between us and tyranny on one critical occasion in our history. And I, like millions of other Australians, was deeply moved and distressed and felt an enormous sense of empathy towards the American people who had suffered this awful deed. Out of that tragedy, of course, Mr Speaker, have come, as always, great stories of the spirit and the heroism of men and women in circumstances of disaster and tragedy. And as much as we are devastated and distressed by what has happened, and as much as we feel repelled by the belief that there should be people on our earth who would want to plot for years to undertake such attacks, as always, the events that followed these attacks have given us a source of great hope and faith in the resilient spirit of men and women who face moral and physical danger and challenge. The stories of heroism that have come out of these events are a tribute to the spirit of the American people and they are a tribute to the spirit of resilient men and women around the world. Who will ever forget the story of that wonderful Father Michael Judge, the chaplain of the New York Police Department, who remained behind to deliver the last rites of the Catholic Church to a dying fireman, or the immense courage of those three people on the plane that crashed in Pittsburgh, who, knowing they faced certain death, uh, decided to tackle the terrorists in the cockpit, perhaps averting even further destruction being rained on either Washington or New York. Mr Speaker, as we struggle as Australians and as we struggle as citizens of the world to come to terms with what has happened, it is certain, Mr, w Mr. Speaker, as others have said, it is certain that the world has changed. We are all diminished and we're all changed and we're all rather struggling with the concept that it will never quite be the same again. Because this is no isolated act of terrorism. It is, this is the product of years of careful planning. It is the product of evil minds. It is the product of an attitude of a group of people 
who in every sense of the, word, of the words to invoke those very evocative words of Winston Churchill to describe the Nazi occupation of Europe should be regarded in their brutish hour of triumphs as the moral outcasts of mankind. Mr Speaker, this is a tragedy, of course, which has touched many Australian homes. There is grief and sadness in hundreds of Australian homes at present. The sheer scale and loss of life suffered by our American friends has perhaps dwarfed the realisation that perhaps up to 80 or 90 Australians have lost their lives. There will be many in this House who will know somebody, who will know the family of somebody who died in New York or in Washington. Moreover, we will know people who, simply as a result of the lottery of life, escaped death. My own case, Mr Speaker, of former economic adviser of mine and a Treasury official employed by Morgan Stanley that has 3,500 employees in this building, but for the happy circumstance for him of being on parental leave for the birth of his second child would have been in that building. 200 of his workmates are yet unaccounted for. And that story can be repeated, Mr Speaker, time without number. And the number of Australians who have died is a reminder of just how interconnected we all are. This attack has brought home to us so many things. It's brought home to us the global character of our world. I suppose um, in their evil disposition, those who launched this attack had that precisely in mind. As you think about it, the, the very outrage of attacking a city and a building which is a monument to inclusion. There is no more multiracial city in the world. There is no city in the world that has more generously welcomed people from around the globe than the city of New York. And you go through the photographs, those poignant photographs of those who died, so many of them, of course, tragically young. You have white faces and black faces you have smiling Irish-American faces, you have Asian faces, you have Hispanic faces, you have bearded faces, you have clean-shaven faces. I have no doubt that amongst those who died were many Americans of Islamic faith, an issue, Mr Speaker, to which I will return in a moment. And in the wake of it, of course, we express our unstinted admiration to those who risk their lives. And the tragedy upon tragedy of an event like this is that people whose sworn duty in life is to help others uh, often in the process risk their own lives and pay a greater price, as do firemen and policemen in circumstances such as this. Mr Speaker, the world will think and ponder and react in different ways. It is important in our reaction to what has occurred, Mr Speaker, to do so with calm and steely determination. Justice, decency and humanity requires that no effort be spared to bring to justice and to punish unconditionally those who have been responsible for these deeds. I had the opportunity, because I was in Washington, Mr Speaker, to express immediately to the administration the willingness of the Australian government to work with the Americans in responding. And I take the opportunity, Mr Speaker, of thanking the Leader of the Opposition for the way in which he has associated the Australian Labor Party with the response that I have made to the administration. These events, Mr Speaker, do bear very much upon the relationship between our two great societies. The World Trade Centre itself 
was a centre for many activities and many activities in which Australians and Americans work together. And it is therefore with symbolic as well as practical residence, Mr Speaker, that any response that is undertaken will have, if we are asked and within the limit of our capability, the involvement of the United States. Mr Speaker, I did have the opportunity when I was in Washington the day after the attack to visit Congress to hear the resolution passed by the House of Representatives and then to go onto the floor of the Senate and particularly to personally extend my condolences to Senator Clinton and Senator Schumer, the two Democrat senators representing the state of New York in the United States Senate. The bonds between our two nations, Mr Speaker, run very strong and very deep. They represent themselves and they manifest themselves in many ways, but none more so than our shared commitment to liberty, our shared commitment to peace. The President said a few days ago that the American people are peaceful people. So indeed are we, Mr Speaker. We have a great peace-loving tradition. We also, when we think of our military tradition, we think of it not in terms of seeking to inflict our views and our will on others, but rather seeking, when required, to stand up and fight for the things that we really believe in. Standing up and fighting for the things that we believe in over the months and the, perhaps the years ahead in the wake of these terrible events will require perseverance. There is united, righteous, deep, seething anger around the world at present, Mr Speaker. But as the months go by and perhaps the early dividends of retaliatory action are not ready and not apparent, some of that anger may subside and some may argue that the extra miles that are required to be travelled are not really worth it. But if those who died last Tuesday are not in the judgment of history to have died in vain, there is an obligation on all of us to persevere, to travel the distance and to persist and to root out the evil that brought about those terrible deeds. But in the process of responding, Mr Speaker, we must do so with care as well as with lethal force. We should understand, Mr Speaker, that barbarism has no ethnicity and evil has no religion. And both around the world and within our own society, we should take pause lest we engage in the evil of scapegoating individual groups within our society. Mr Speaker, I've said on a number of occasions that I know that my fellow Australians of Islamic faith are overwhelmingly as appalled about what happened as I am as an inadequately practising Christian. And this is an assault on values common to all the great religions of the world and it's also an assault on the values of many people who profess no religion. And I say to my fellow Australians of Islamic faith or of Middle Eastern descent, I extend to you the hand of friendship. You are part of our great society, you are part of the fabric of the great, decent, freedom-loving, fair-minded Australian nation. Yeah. And they are as entitled to share my outrage and my sorrow and my anger and my sadness as are others within our community, Mr Speaker. Because wouldn't it be a terrible, tragic, obscene irony 
if in responding, however we do it as individuals or as nations, in responding to these um, terrible terrorist attacks, we forsook the very things that we believed had been assaulted at last Tuesday in New York, Mr Speaker. It's been said many times in the wake of um, these attacks that words are inadequate to express how you feel. Nobody is ever really prepared for personal tragedy. Nobody is ever really prepared for the sudden death of a, of a wife or a husband or a son or a daughter or a sibling or another loved one or a close friend. No nation is ever ready or ever prepared to respond to a tragedy of this order and of this magnitude. And in the end, Mr Speaker, the quality of our people and the quality of our society will be judged by how we respond. We will be judged in the eyes of those left bereaved by the people who died. If we no, we will be judged very harshly if we do not respond effectively into the full measure of, a, of our capability. But we will be also judged very critically if we respond in a careless or an indiscriminate fashion. Mr Speaker, can I say finally that the experience of being in the American capital at the time enabled me to feel a sense of the despair and the desolation of the American people, but also a sense of their great spirit and their great resilience and their great faith and the depth of their belief in the inherent decency of their society. The wonderful words spoken by the United States Ambassador at the memorial service earlier today beautifully evoked the spirit of a people, a people that have carried heavy burdens, have suffered a great deal, and a people, Mr Speaker, that have been joined to this country in every major conflict of the last 100 years. In every way, Mr Speaker, the attack on New York and Washington and the circumstances surrounding it did constitute an attack upon the metropolitan territory of the United States of America within the provisions of Articles 4 and 5 of the ANZUS Treaty. And if that treaty means anything, if our debt as a nation to the people of the United States in the darkest days of World War II means anything, if the comradeship and the friendship and the common bonds of democracy and a belief in liberty and fraternity and justice mean anything, it means that the ANZUS Treaty applies and that the ANZUS Treaty is properly invoked. Mr Speaker, as a proud patriotic Australian, I was literally moved to tears by what occurred in the United States. I was filled with admiration for the spirit of the American people, and I can with genuine affection and fondness say that their behaviour in the wake of those events and their determination to respond appropriately and to heal the wounds and to help those who mourn and grieve demonstrates very powerfully that the American people do live in the words of their wonderful national anthem in the land of the free and the home of the brave. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, I am proud to be supporting this resolution and I thank the Prime Minister for his consultation on its content. Mr Speaker, a new chapter is being written in American history, one of tragedy and terror, 
but also one of strength and courage that few could match. The terrorists may have set out to destroy America's confidence and faith in itself, but instead they have revealed the best in Americans, what makes it such a great and resilient nation. Their evil has prompted strength, not cowardice, righteous anger, not fear. We've seen it in the selflessness of the rescuers, those firemen and police who charged up the stairs of the burning buildings and were never seen again. We saw it in the courage of those who helped others to safety and the courage of those still waiting to hear the fate of their friends and family members and the courage of New Yorkers as they've stood by to encourage those who are engaged in the process of rescuing those still within the buildings. And we saw it in the enormous courage of the people who on the aircraft sacrificed themselves in order to stop an even greater tragedy, massive though this tragedy has been, how much more awesome would it have been to all of us in the rest of the world as well as those in the United States if that plane had continued on its intended destination. Those of us who witnessed this attack on our television screens will never forget the horror of it. However many times we replay it in our heads, I don't think we'll ever get used to it. I think it'll be one of those events in which we always remember what we were doing on Tuesday night, if we were still last week, if we were still awake when it occurred, or Wednesday morning, if we woke up to the horrifying news. I remember exactly where I was. It was driving from a meeting in Berwick towards the centre of Melbourne when a member of my staff rang up and said there's an unconfirmed report that an aircraft has hit the World Trade Centre. And then the nightmare unfolded from that point on. We'll never forget our feelings when we first saw those extraordinary pictures of the attack and tried for the first time to make sense of it. Wherever we were, I think we all knew that things were changing forever although we do not know quite how or why. Today we think of the American victims, thousands of them and their families. We also think of the 70 more Australians missing, many believed dead, in this terrible tragedy. I know that in the coming days and weeks, difficult national decisions will have to be made as we show our support for the United States and those in the world community who are united in their fight against terrorism. The United States is a target because it accepts responsibility. I've often said it in the past that one of the most unselfish acts in human history was a decision by the United States after the last world war, that they were prepared to see their people as a target, perhaps of nuclear devastation, in order to defend values of freedom and the security of the nations who were their allies in World War II and who subsequently emerged. The United States need not have been like that, the United States could quite easily have retreated into isolation, an economy virtually self-sufficient unto itself. Instead, the United States chose to be a different sort of country. The United States chose to be a country that would accept responsibility even though it could mean at some, in some sets of circumstances that the United States would be utterly devastated. Well, the Cold War has gone. But the United States' acceptance of responsibility continues. The last time that we were engaged substantially with the United States uh, in, a, in a conflict was, of course, the Gulf War, though I guess you can count the peacekeeping operations since then as well. But in actual war, it was the Gulf War. If it turns out to have been the bin Laden group that is responsible for this act of terrorism, then there is a direct link between that conflict and these events, that conflict in which we, as a parliament, approved our active engagement. There are many reasons why we should stand with the United States in this particular hour, and that is one of them. That is one of those reasons. The United States continues to accept responsibility, and it must be supported in their willingness to do so. We show our support for the United States in this fight because the fight against international terrorism is our fight. This is not only because of those Australians missing, believed, killed, 
but also because of our belief in freedom, a belief we hold in common with the United States. It was an attack on all of us and all of ours. It was a shocking thing to think of the vulnerability of the Australians accompanying the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister himself in Washington at the time of the attack, so very close to the White House, which we now, as I said, believe only escaped harm through the self-sacrifice of the passengers on the flight that went into the ground near Pittsburgh. Nevertheless, I am glad the Prime Minister was there in the United States and was able to go to Congress and had our support in person at a time when it must have meant a lot to our allies to have you there, Prime Minister. Your presence there certainly brought the events closer here, as did the knowledge that so many Australians have been lost, and our hearts go out to their families as they wait for news. The horror has already unfolded for us, but I very much fear we are going to experience a new wave of that horror as the weeks go by and names get added to that list of numbers which is constantly, from day to day, being readjusted. The scale of this unspeakable act of terrorism is so great, we sometimes lose sight of the loss in New York and in the hijacked aircraft of those 70 Australians. America is not a foreign country to our people. So many of us travel there and work there. This makes us feel even more that it was an attack on all of us, luck or fate might have put any of us there on that day. The Australian Labor Party is missing one of its most loyal and active members in Andrew Knox, who worked on one of the top floors in one of the destroyed towers and is still missing. It is with great sadness that I express my condolences to his family, friends and political colleagues as they wait for news of Andrew. Andrew Knox was a member of the South Australian branch of the ALP and a member of our campaign team in Aiken. Indeed, for a, at the last election, indeed for a period of time, he was a candidate for pre-selection in uh, this forthcoming election, the area he grew up in and loved. Andrew's family has been contacted by many of those he assisted as an employee of the Australian Workers' Union, and his efforts for them will also be remembered. My thoughts are with Tom and Mary and Andrew's parents and Stuart, his brother. Confirmed dead in the tragedy, a Qantas baggage handler, Alberto Dominguez, 66, and retired Red Cross worker, Yvonne Kennedy, 62, both from Sydney. There are at least another 69 missing, including 23-year-old Chris Porter, 23, from Brisbane. We can only guess what they went through in their last hours, and our thoughts and prayers are with their families. Let us not forget either that the many nations that are mourning lost sons and daughters now the size of the calamity is truly international. Among the missing are several hundred Britons and Germans each, possibly up to 500 Mexicans, at least 50 Bangladeshis, 70 Italians, many Pakistanis, Malaysians, Turks, Thais. It seems nearly 40 nations have lost citizens in this shocking attack. They went to the heart of the world economy and they found the world there. And the world has suffered as a result. I've heard that there have been some who blame Muslims for this tragedy, all Muslims for this tragedy. I think we need to take a leaf out of Mayor Giuliani's book here. Even after all that was suffered in his city, he has never stopped talking about the need for unity and he stressed that all New Yorkers were appalled, Muslims, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, Hindus and others. He called on his fellow New Yorkers not to let the terrorists win by losing their humanity at this time. He has been an extraordinary figure, Mayor Giuliani, in these events, commanding the rescue operation, comforting the afflicted, leading his people in the darkest hour that New York has ever experienced. If a man who has to deal with the full horror of this in his own city can keep his community together, surely we can keep ours together as well. And I especially call on those in influential media positions to exercise responsibility. Those of us in public office must use our influence to maintain our unity as a nation. I'd like to quote what British Prime Minister Tony Blair said in his speech on this issue. We do not yet know the exact origin of this evil, 
But if, as appears likely, it is so-called Islamic fundamentalists, we know they do not speak or act for the vast majority of decent, law-abiding Muslims throughout the world. I say to our Arab and Muslim friends, neither you nor Islam is responsible for this. On the contrary, we know you share our shock at this terrorism, and we ask, as friends, you to make common cause with us in defeating this barbarism that is totally foreign to the true spirit and teachings of Islam. We've all been impressed by the US government's rational, deliberative and calibrated response to this tragedy. America's quiet, unyielding anger is not doubted, and it's shared by your friends. Lincoln said we should have faith that right will make might. By ensuring rightness of action, the US will be able to draw on the might of many countries. When it takes action abroad, the US government and its allies must decide how to crack down on the groups plotting this carnage, but in such a way as to avoid any more martyrs, anything that would feed the revolutionaries' cause. The great challenge before the US government and all of us is to show its people that it means to stop this sort of terrorism, but not at the expense of taking away people's basic freedoms, freedoms on which the USA was founded. As the Prime Minister himself said, it would be a tragedy if those who committed this barbaric act should destroy the essential qualities of the nation that they attacked and turn them in in any way to the characters that they themselves already are. I don't believe for one moment that's going to happen. I don't believe it for one moment. This sort of behaviour is not new. People have sacrificed themselves and others to draw attention to their cause in every generation and in most countries. The difference is technology, the sheer scale of the terror they can wreak. Difficult though it is to believe, the scale of this atrocity could have been and could one day be even greater. It could have been nuclear or chemical or biological weapons, now so readily deliverable by mechanisms other than those formerly employed by militaries. <coughs> the challenge is to stop the terrorists with every means at our disposal, but it must be done in such a way as to avoid feeding the revolutionary cause that creates new martyrs. It takes common sense and coolness, and the United States has certainly shown that. We in Australia owe our freedom to the United States. In our darkest hour in 1941, our wartime Prime Minister called on the Americans, and they did not let us down. In the Battle of the Coral Sea and the Battle of Mid Midway, they were there for us and fought valiantly, with many lives lost to halt the progress of the enemy. And we were there too. We saved ourselves at the same time we were helped by them. That event, that seminal event in Australian history and American history was what created the ANZUS Treaty. It's an extraordinary thing to think, really, that though we have been engaged with the United States military on many occasions since that point of time, this is actually the first time the ANZUS Treaty has been formally invoked in the history of the treaty. And I think that demonstrates, and I think too you'd probably find that was the case with NATO as well, and I think that that does in fact demonstrate the seriousness with which the globe is taking this new threat to international security. We must do our utmost to assist in fighting this very difficult enemy, one that lives in the shadows, one without a face. We do have to beat it because it's struck at the heart of what we believe in, our freedom and our safety. The attacks on New York and Washington DC have fundamentally changed the modern threat of terrorism. Mass terrorism is now a reality. Governments worldwide must respond to this new reality. National leaders must demonstrate that they are prepared to deal with a fundamentally new level of threat to ensure that people can go about their lives in peace and security. Australia will need to commit itself to an international intelligence, police and military effort against those who have planned the atrocities in New York and Washington and those who have supported and harboured the perpetrators. We must do this in this country in a bipartisan fashion 
and see this effort through, no matter what the result of the election later this year. Joining the strong international coalition to fight terrorism wherever it threatens democratic and peaceful nations, as suggested by Secretary Powell, is the right way to go. This will mean integrating more closely our intelligence and police agencies with their international counterparts. It will also mean providing appropriate military and police support to international counter-terrorist operations. A long-term counter-terrorist strategy and resource commitment is now required. The role of the SAS and Commonwealth law enforcement intelligence other agencies will be critical, and they must have to do the tools to do their job in the modern terrorist environment. Well, we put forward some ideas as far as that is concerned, and this is a time for bipartisanship working through those ideas together. But this is also primarily not a time yet for action that will come. It is a time for grieving. And it has been magnificent to be an Australian amongst our fellow Australians as we've witnessed the outpouring of grief that, and emotion that has come forth from all of us. It has been good to see the flowers placed outside the consulates, the people flocking to church yesterday to add their prayers to those of the Americans for all those killed and all those who have lost their friends and family. There are some lovely stories told by the ambassador in his uh, remarks, including that experience he had uh, with picketing ANSET workers uh, at uh, Canberra Airport. I can add one to them. I'm told that there is now a list that those ANSET workers are signing up to, whereby, and there are some 500 on it that there were by Saturday night, whereby that should they re receive their termination payments, or when they do, they will ensure that one day's pay is contributed to the, contributed to the families <coughs> of the air crew who died in this attack and the families of the Australians who died likewise. Yeah. Yeah. At a time like these, you realise how good it is to have your family safely together. And it's at times like this you come back to what is truly important in all our lives, our love and affection for each other, our commitment to values of decency, tolerance, civilisation and freedom. These things sustain us. They'll never be taken away. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Before I recognise the Deputy Prime Minister, could I simply point out to all members that I understand the Whips have agreed on a specific time allocation for each of the speakers to the condolence motion to enable the maximum participation of parliamentarians and so with the agreement of the House, I'll instruct the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In joining the uh, Leader of the Government and the Leader of the Opposition in speaking to this, and I say at the outset that the terrorist attack on the United States, on New York and Washington on Tuesday will mean that the date September the 11th will be a date that lives on in infamy. It's a date that we will not forget, a date that we cannot forget a date that we should never forget. It was a monstrous act, a premeditated and calculated mass murder, aimed at ordinary people, but not just ordinary Americans, rather people from a multitude of nations going about their ordinary lives and, as others have said so eloquently, constitutes an attack on decent people everywhere. It was the very embodiment of evil, a visitation of evil upon our world that has left us struggling, Mr Speaker, for comprehension. No random act of a single madman, no sudden and tragic breakdown of one human being led to this. We've known those tragedies in our society. And while we cannot fully understand how they might come about, we can find at least some comprehension of them. The chilling and horrible truth of Tuesday's events, however, is that this was not one man but many. It was not a sudden madness, but a cold and careful and deliberate assault. It was done without humanity without compassion, with no human feeling that any of us could regard or endorse as legitimate. It was, in all ways and in all its dreadful execution, evil. Mr Speaker, we mourn the loss of lives that our friends in America have suffered. We mourn with their families for those confirmed Australian dead, 
and we pray that by some miracle the 69 Australians yet unaccounted for may be found safe and returned to their families. And in this country we feel a particular shock and horror because we, like America, would see ourselves as part of a new world. Uh, like that nation, we're a new nation that has provided refuge and succour to millions from other parts of the world seeking a new life, new beginning, freedom from hatred and hatreds. But Tuesday has visited those dreadful hatreds upon all of us. It has attacked the very openness and regard for each other upon which Australian democracy is based. It tends dreadfully to make us want to suspect others, and it makes us afraid, Mr Speaker, for our children and for their futures. Mr Speaker, as has been said, of course, uh, the perpetrators of this horrifying terrorism must be, will be, ruthlessly pursued and brought to book. And Australia will stand steadfast with its allies in this. We must not rest until the task is done. It should also be said, though, that while ruthless, our response must be fair and just. We must not inflame misunderstanding, but rather build more widely a deeper understanding of the sanctity and value of life and of human freedoms and the democratic traditions that then are built upon those essential values. The battles we now enter against ter terrorism are battles that will be fought in the name of our democratic freedoms, a fight to re-establish the trust and the safety and the openness of our society. And as, our, as others have also alluded to, we've heard uh, some evidence that might suggest uh, a backlash against some members of the Muslim communities here in Australia. I would certainly join with all who would condemn such actions in the strongest possible terms. Mr Speaker, if we are to deem people guilty because of some association or to condemn them because of their background, we are playing, in fact, right into the hands of the terrorists. We are adopting the very values that they espouse but we reject. And what they want to do is spread these dreadful values from one world to ours. What we stand for in Australia is an end to those hatreds. We must judge a person by what they do, not where they or their parents came from. And that is why we are so affronted by this terrorism. That is why we must play our part in pursuing them. Mr Speaker, I won't delay the House for long because uh, much of what should be said has been said so eloquently by the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. There are many others who want to speak. I do, however, want to particularly thank those who sprang into action in this place at very short notice for all sorts of events and contingencies and planning and so forth that needed to be addressed. And that obviously happened very late, uh, uh, or sorry, very early uh, on our time uh, Wednesday morning last week. Uh, and for those who were able to ensure uh, that uh, the Prime Minister was in contact uh, with people back here, myself included, uh, and for those who covered off on a whole range of other very, very important uh, matters, I do record my very great respect. I would too, of course, want to pay tribute to all of those emergency workers and volunteers who rushed to the aid of victims in New York and Washington last Tuesday. Uh, we've all seen and heard the reports of the loss of life among New York firefighters, police officers in particular, and the reports of the extraordinary heroism that they displayed in what was to them uh, their line of work and how magnificently they responded. While we mourn for them, they are, of course, also a symbol of hope and of strength. Now, Mr Speaker, I think we all know in our hearts that as long as our society has people who selflessly give their lives for others in this way, while our communities come together in times of crisis in the way that New York has done, democracy has indeed a very strong future. As I reflect for a moment on this, I'm uh, reminded of Solzhenitsyn's words as he, having survived the barbarities of uh, Soviet uh, uh, death camps, observed that the dividing line in the end between good and evil lies in truth somewhere across every heart. All of us know what it is to struggle from time to time with resentment, with jealousy, with demeaning thoughts about others. Indeed, Mr Speaker, it seems to me that the strength of a civilised society is built to a very great degree on the extent to which the individuals who make that society up are able to put aside their baser instincts and encourage in themselves in their children and their neighbours, the more noble and less selfish instincts in our makeup. It is to us impossible to comprehend that there are others who would inflame the very basest of human behaviour 
Yet those people plainly do exist. We have been forcefully reminded of that in recent days. We must face that reality. We must not be naive. And our attack on this cancer will succeed if we believe in and build on our own values. We must not fail in this. Terrorism cannot be allowed to win. This will not be a short-term battle, I suspect. It will not be easy to eradicate from our midst uh, around the world those who would engage in outrageous and unforgivable behaviour. Whilst initial action may be rapid in coming, I think we should brace ourselves for a reality that to rid ourselves of this sort of uh, appalling behaviour uh, based in such appalling attitudes is something that all of us must commit to for however long it takes. Yeah, yeah. The question is that the motion be agreed to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I um, wholeheartedly join with the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition in this motion of condolence for the atrocities committed last uh, Tuesday. September the 11th will never be forgotten, Mr Speaker. It's changed again, we view things, and it's worth reflecting that when the end of the Cold War came, then US President Bush declared that there would be a new world order, a world that we then hoped would not only be free of the threat of a nuclear holocaust, but one where former adversary, adversaries would come together to end wars through peaceful means. Now, it's true, Mr Speaker, that events in Rwanda and former Yugoslavia, to name just a few, cruelly dashed those hopes. But it really is with the horrific scenes from New York, Washington and Pennsylvania that we now know that far from abolishing war, the new millennium has simply given it a new and more terrifying form. It was, as the New York uh, Times declared the morning after the attack, one of those moments when history splits and we define the world as before and after. It went on that if a flight full of commuters can be turned into a missile of war, everything is dangerous. If four planes can be taken over simultaneously by suicidal hijackers, then we can never be quite sure again that any bad intention can be thwarted, no matter how irrational or loathsome. Now, what that editorial highlighted, Mr Speaker, was how the world has changed for all of us as a result of the events witnessed last week, and not just because of the horror we feel at the destruction of so many lives. The complacent security that all of us felt before Tuesday have now been swept away. We now feel vulnerable, even doing some of the simple things as catching a flight or of going to the office. Will anyone ever again now be able to take a flight without at least considering the consequences of what happened in America? Will we ever be again be able to enter a high-rise office block without wondering whether that building too could be a target? We now know war no longer has to be declared. It can arrive, unannounced and with horrifying force right amongst people simply going about their everyday lives. The weapons of the first war of the 21st century have not been guns or bombs, but commercial jetliners filled with people, no different from us, who boarded a plane to travel across a country for business or to meet their families or to go on holiday. And their targets are not rival armies but office blocks filled with tens of thousands of people who were doing nothing more threatening than sitting at their desks, working at their computers or talking on their phones, just as millions of people do every day of the year in every country of the world. Now, if the greatest cities of the greatest power the world has ever known can have such destruction wrought upon it by 20 people, wielding Stanley knives, how can anyone feel safe again? The vulnerability that we now feel was perhaps the principal goal of the terrorists who timed their attacks in such a way as to force us all to be its witnesses. 
because whilst few witnessed the first attack, they knew that the cameras would be trained on the burning tower. And in the world of CNN and instant communication, millions on every continent, even those watching the late news, half a world away, as I guess most of the people in this house were, could be made to watch the second plane dive into the tower. It's hard to imagine a more horrifying scene than the one that we witnessed on Tuesday night, as hundreds of those office workers screamed in vain for help out of the smashed windows of the World Trade Centres, and in some cases flung themselves out because of what could only have been unimaginable pain and terror as the flames engulfed their workplaces. When those buildings collapsed, we knew we were witnessing the destruction not just of two great New York landmarks, but right there in our lounge rooms, the deaths of literally thousands of people and unimaginable pain and grief for tens of thousands of families. As one of the many people who witnessed the collapse said, I'm not seeing concrete and steel, I'm seeing people. We now know that many of these families had rung their friends and families to tell them of their love before they attempted to flee the buildings. Loved ones who perhaps just hours earlier had kissed their partners goodbye before stepping onto the bus or the train for an ordinary day at the office. What thoughts, Mr Speaker, must have gone through the minds of these people as they then watched the buildings fall and knew that as they fell they were witnessing the deaths of their husbands, wives, children, fathers, mothers, lovers and friends. Despite this, many of these same people still walk the streets of New York from hospital to hospital carrying photographs of their missing loved ones. Even when all hope seems gone, they refuse to give in. The terrorists also couldn't overcome the bravery of the hundreds of firefighters, police officers, ambulance workers and others who raced into the buildings to save lives, knowing full well the danger that they must have faced and, as a consequence, themselves suffered horrendous losses. But in doing so, they've already shown us that the terrorists haven't won, because if even in the midst of such carnage terrorism cannot, become cannot overcome human basic values like love and hope and bravery, it can't ultimately triumph. And so today our thoughts go out to all the American people and we meet today to demonstrate that you are not alone and that as you stood by us in World War II, we will stand by you in your hour of need, in thought and in deed. But as US Defence Secretary Donald Rumsfeld has pointed out, the buildings destroyed in New York were not called the New York Trade Centre or even the US Trade Centre, but the World Trade Centre. This is not just a symbolic point, Mr Speaker, because the dead come from nearly 40 nations, Australia amongst them. The Australian death toll in the terrorist attacks could exceed that of the Port Arthur massacre and will thus represent the greatest loss of Australian lives as a result of a deliberate act since the end of World War II. Some of these, we know, were like Red Cross volunteer Yvonne Kennedy and the Qantas baggage handler Alberto Dominguez, who were on holidays of a lifetime and died aboard doomed planes. But the bulk of them will be some of Australia's brightest stars, brilliant young Australians whose prodig prodigious talents <laughs> led them to New York to demonstrate that they could stand with the best in the financial world. Here the Labor Party has not remained untouched, with Andrew Knox, himself a brilliant young industrial advocate and one of our rising stars, whose life has now almost certainly been lost amid the rubble of the Twin Towers. But amidst all this grief and understandable demands for instant vengeance, we must not lash out at the first available target. 
Above all, we must not rush to judge, to judgment or to stereotype the perpetrators. The demonstrations by some Palestinians in support of the terrorists indeed did sicken us all, but they are not clearly representative of the feelings of the Muslim community in Australia, <coughs> who have condemned the attacks in the strongest possible terms and held prayer vigils for the victims. The violence directed against Muslim communities in Australia shames us all, and above all, it shames the victims and the memory of them in New York, Washington and Pennsylvania. Instead, we must calmly gather the evidence, identify those responsible for this horrific crime and build a coalition of nations as occurred in the Gulf War, and then coolly bring to justice the perpetrators to ensure only those responsible are punished. And the tragedy and terror of the past week is not visited upon more innocent victims. Australia also can't ignore the consequences of this new threat, and Labor has offered the government bipartisan support for a renewed effort against possible terrorist attacks at home. And I hope, in the spirit of the bipartisanship that surrounds this resolution today, that that issue can indeed be advanced. The Leader of the Opposition has put forward a ten-point plan that the Australian Labor Party believes Australians must now do undertake to fight terrorism. There will be significant changes in coming months, Mr. Mr. Speaker, that will impact on all of us as we are forced to respond to this new threat. It may be as insignificant as meals being served on aeroplanes, as knives are banned, for example, from cabins, perhaps, to delays at airport security and greater controls on our movement around the world. We all accept these sorts of changes are now a fact of life after last Tuesday. But we mustn't overreact. We must not allow the terrorists to force us into a new dark age. As US Senator Joseph Biden warned within hours of the attack, if we alter our basic freedoms, our civil liberties, we will have lost the war before it's begun. And I'm also reminded, Mr Speaker, of President John F. Kennedy's inaugural address in 1961 when he declared, let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and success of liberty. Only now do we see just how terrible that price could be and how great is the burden. America, as the symbol of democracy, was the principal victim, but all of us, Mr Speaker, were the target. So when we say we stand with the United States, we're not just saying this because of our shared history and because in every, way of, in every war fought by America since, Australia became a nation that we've stood together. Mr Speaker, we stand together also because the attacks on the World Trade Towers and the Pentagon were indisputably an attack on freedom and democracy everywhere. The question is the motion be agreed to. The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I join with others in uh, supporting the Prime Minister's um, um, and the Leader of the Opposition's motion before the House here this afternoon. And I join with them in condemning, as strongly as any human being can condemn anything, the terrorist attacks that were committed last Tuesday against the World Trade Center uh, buildings in New York and uh, against the Pentagon in Washington. Mr Speaker, last Tuesday, the 11th of September, will indeed be one of those days when we will always remember what we were doing at the time we were first informed of the attacks. I myself I was at home. I'd spent the day in Sydney. I was sitting at my desk working on my computer. Somebody rang my office and said, turn on the television. The World Trade Center has been hit. 
by an aircraft seems an extraordinary proposition. And the th first thought that came to my mind was how bizarre that an aircraft could have lost so much height and accidentally flown into that building. And I turned on my television screen and within moments a second plane went into the second tower. And I sat there for some hours watching the appalling scene unfold. Throughout all, the, all of that time, as you can imagine, Mr Speaker, in my house there was a great deal of telephone contact. We, um, of course, I spoke with the acting Prime Minister. I spoke with officials, one kind or another, as we put together our consular crisis centre. But I guess I also had the experience that many have. I thought of who do I know in New York, and I thought of somebody working there. I knew he worked down in that area near the World Trade Centre in the lower Manhattan area. And um, my wife and I tried to get in touch with him. And, you know, we couldn't for ages. We finally, my wife came up with a great idea to send an email. She sent the email and an email came back. And um, that was a very happy moment that night. But when you reflect on it, how many people didn't get the email back? How many people have never heard back? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, nearly 5,000 people are missing as a result of these attacks in what, what, in what must be termed one of the greatest human tragedies of uh, the last two centuries. It's estimated that people from at least 19 nationalities have been killed, and of these we now know that at least three fellow Australians are dead, and uh, as others have said, there are 69 missing, unaccounted for, although we're hopeful that that number may come down over the next few hours. It's almost certain to be the greatest number of Australians killed in a sin single incident overseas outside of wartime. So our prayers go out to those whose families have been affected, to their loved ones and to their friends. Mr uh, Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the role performed by many people um, in these difficult circumstances, by our Consul General in New York, yeah. Ken Allen, and his staff, only new to the job, must have been very difficult for him. Our ambassador in Washington, Michael Thorley, and his staff, our ambassador to the United Nations in New York, John Douth, and his staff, and to all those people in my department who did an extraordinarily good job. By one o'clock in the morning on the 12th of September, my department had uh, set up a crisis centre and uh, analysed what resources were required and to plan consular and other responses to the crisis. And a telephone call centre was activated and established by 4.30 in the morning, and the first 20 volunteer te telephone operators were brief briefed at 5.30 for the task that lay ahead of them. In, 20, in the first 24 hours, there were 15,000 calls handled on these lines, and a further 20,000 were received subsequently. So, Mr. Speaker, it's um, a very good effort done by those, those hard-working public servants, many who went without too much sleep, as they tried, on the one hand, to reassure many Australians, and on the other, um, to do their best to find the whereabouts of those who were unaccounted for. Like others, Mr Speaker, I'd also too like to acknowledge the efforts and indeed the heroism of the thousands of Americans, the firemen, the police, and some many um, citizens not involved in official service, for example, the construction workers who did so much to try to save people's lives at both the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And Mr Speaker, others have said as well, and I feel very strongly about this, <coughs> that the United States has uh, always been the champion in my lifetime of liberal democracy. And uh, it stood up for us in World War II. In the in, it, it, stood up, it stood up to communism in the Berlin, Berlin blockade, in the Korean War, in the Cold War. It's always stood against tyranny and oppression. And, Mr Speaker, we have proudly stood beside America in every conflict there has been through the last, uh, it's been involved in through um, the last century. It's these terrorists who have brought innocent victims to the front line. For this and the threat they, they represent to our institutions 
and our values, there must be a unified national and international response. Mr. Speaker, our government is heartened by the near uniform condemnation of this heinous crime by the nations of the world. But it must be remembered that words are not deeds. The challenge for the international community is to join together in a concerted international effort against terrorism and those who provide terrorists with safe haven. And, uh, Mr Speaker, this House, I think, has already today demonstrated at the political level so exactly what you hear at the community level, and that is that Australians stand ready to do their part. We'll stand with our most important ally in this time of need. For the first time in 50 years, and indeed almost to a day, 50 years after the signing of the ANZUS Treaty, we invoke the ANZUS Treaty with the support of the opposition because we regarded these terrorist actions as an attack upon the United States of America within the, meanings, the meaning of Article 4 and Article 5 of the ANZUS Treaty. And as the Prime Minister has said on several occasions, Mr Speaker, Australia stands ready to provide military support to the extent that it is needed and to the extent to which we are capable. Some people will ask whether action taken by the United States and its allies is legal. And I think it's important to understand, Mr Speaker, that there is full coverage already in the United Nations uh, Charter and through a United Nations Security Council resolution for appropriate action to be taken by the United, Nations, uh, by the United States. Mr Speaker, Article 51 of the United Nations Charter says that nothing in the present Charter shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defence self if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations. Mr Speaker, this was without any doubt an armed attack against a member of the United Nations and, as Article 51 makes clear, the United, Na the United States has a right of self-defence. The House may also be interested to know, Mr Speaker, that the United Nations Security Council on, I think, the 13th of September um, unanimously passed a resolution which, un amongst other things, said that it calls on all states to work together urgently to bring to justice the perpetrators, organisers and sponsors of these terrorist attacks and stresses that those responsible for aiding supporting or harbouring the perpetrators, organisers and sponsors of these acts will be held accountable. Mr Speaker, whatever doubts or scepticism many members in this House may have about the United Nations and its efficacy, I think the Security Council resolution that was passed so soon after the attacks and with such a degree of un unanimity, not even with the usual delicate attempts to try to negotiate some sort of a consensus, a paper-thin consensus, but in this case a solid unanimity of support for the United States, its uh, right to self-defence and its right to bring to justice those responsible for these appalling acts. Mr Speaker, I said already in the context of any military assistance what the Prime Minister had said, that we would do what we could usefully and within our capabilities, but we will also use other channels, our intelligence connections, our diplomatic channels, in order to assist the United States deal with the appalling problem of terrorism. I spoke last uh, Friday afternoon from my electorate office in Adelaide to the Pakistani Foreign Minister Abdul Sattar, and I encouraged him in my conversation, I encouraged him to cooperate with the United States in their efforts to locate Osama bin Laden and in their efforts, the United States' efforts, to fight terrorism wherever it may be. There's no doubt Pakistan has an important role to play here and it's appropriate for Australia to make its own effort to help to persuade Pakistan to take appropriate action to assist the United States and the rest of the global community in its fight against terrorism. And um, Foreign Minister Abdul Sattar gave me, I might say, Mr Speaker, a very positive response to my telephone call. 
In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, I think we all know, as the, I think the Prime Minister said, that as a result of these terrorist attacks, the world will never be the same again. The international agenda will change and has changed. Terrorism and other transboundary crimes will become substantially more important, indeed dominant, international agenda items. Because although the world has passed many a resolution, there are many UN conventions condemning terrorism and designed to oppose terrorism. This just proves, if proof were ever needed, that the world has not done enough to counter terrorism, and it must do more and it must do better. And that effort will be very strongly supported, Mr. Speaker, by this government and by not just this government, but by the whole of this country. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, we face, I think, a very great um, challenge as an international community to respond to these acts of terror. But as others have wisely said in this debate, it is important that that response be measured, that it be calculated, that it be considered, that it be thought through, and that it be done with as broad a coalition of international support as is practical and as is possible. The United States absolutely can count on its NATO allies and it can count on Australia. And it can absolutely count on a number of other countries. But it is going to be important to ensure that there is a broad coalition to, 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 uh, to fight this big fight that lies ahead of us against terrorism. So, Mr. Speaker, I can say I have been very impressed by the re uh, resourceful, um, strong, thoughtful response so far taken by the United States administration. They demonstrate strength, but they demonstrate considered balance. And w we look forward to working with them over the months ahead, Mr. Speaker, to assist them in this great war against terrorism. All those people who will have died at the World Trade Center and at the Pentagon, those people must not die in vain, including the Australians. Those Australians who have died must not die in vain, and we as Australians must do all we possibly can to fight terrorism as a result of this heinous crime. Mm -hmm. question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Kingsford Smith. Well, Mr Speaker, as the Prime Minister observed in his remarks today, this is a very sombre occasion for, the, for this House and for Australia. The terrorist uh, attacks on the United States last Tuesday constitute the worst single act of absolute evil perpetrated in my lifetime. And this is a whole new class of terrorism. It's mass terrorism being carried out with real-time worldwide media coverage. More than 5,000 lives have been lost. More than 5,000 innocent victims killed in the most horrific of circumstances. People of many nations, many faiths, more than 70 amongst them Australians. The destruction itself is truly astounding. The cost of reconstruction and repair will amount to many billions of dollars, and the economic effects will be felt across the globe. The world has indeed changed, and as many people have said, this is an attack upon civilization, and civilization must respond. Those responsible for this great atrocity must be pursued and brought to account. No stone should be left unturned in this task. Today's motion rightly expresses the horror felt by all Australians about those terrorist attacks. It conveys our heartfelt condolences to the families and the loved ones of those killed or missing. It very rightly applauds the courageous efforts of those engaged in the rescue and recovery operations. Indeed, the heroism of the firefighters, the police, the military personnel, and the countless ordinary people of all walks of life, that, uh, that heroism really knows no bounds. Today's motion rightly affirms that these acts of mass terrorism represent an assault upon the people and the values of free societies everywhere. And of course, the motion endorses Australia's commitment to support the United States led action to pursue those responsible. In this task, Australia stands four square with the United States. 
The government's response to this terrible tragedy has been absolutely appropriate, and the opposition is, of course, completely supportive of it. We must not only sympathise with the US, we must, not only <clears throat> we must not only express our distress and our shock, we must do everything within our power to assist through our intelligence services, our law enforcement agencies and through the capabilities of our defence forces in helping to identify, to locate and to bring to account those responsible for these terrible deeds. President George Bush has declared the United States to be at war against terrorism. He has rightly elevated the struggle against terrorism to be a great national and international undertaking. But no one should underestimate either how difficult or how protracted this international campaign may prove to be. This is no easy undertaking, but we have no alternative other than to embark upon a journey down a very difficult and dangerous road. The first step in winning any war is knowing one's enemy. The criminals responsible for directing these terrible acts in New York and Washington chose to remain hidden. They have not stepped forward to claim responsibility. Some people have suggested that this is cowardice, but these people are not cowards. It would be a mistake to think that they are. They are fanatics utterly devoid of respect for life, respect for their own lives, let alone the lives of others. These are people of fearsome determination and resolution. They are highly intelligent. They are cold, calculating, and possessed of considerable resources of manpower, of finance, and expertise. They are very patient. They planned and pre prepared these attacks over a long period of time, perhaps as much as two or three years. They failed in their attempt to destroy the World Trade Center in 1993. This year they were clearly determined to finish that task. And in this, their ambition knew no bounds. They planned simultaneous strikes against the World Trade Center, the symbolic center of American capitalism, the Pentagon, the central command post of US military power, and it appears the White House or Capitol building, as well, of course, is on the very heart of American democracy. They will also have thought long and hard about the likely reactions from the United States and the world community. Indeed, we should be very clear in recognising that one of the primary purposes of these attacks is to elicit a large-scale military response by the United States and its allies against targets across the Islamic world. The terrorist objective is indeed to, to trigger a conflict which will further radicalise Arab public opinion and destabilise Arab governments who are friendly to the West. This is not an argument for not responding. We must respond and do whatever needs to be done to eliminate this threat. But in doing so, we must be aware that a major military campaign is precisely what the terrorist perpetrators hope for. There has, of course, already been much commentary about the prime suspect. Osama bin Laden. If, as it seems likely, the bin Laden organisation is confirmed as a group with significant responsibility for the attacks, we must think very carefully about the nature of our response. If this is war, then it's war against an enemy who is a man and not a state. It will be a war against an enemy who has no structured organisation, no headquarters, no fixed address. It will be war against an enemy whose followers live in different countries and feel loyalty not so much to bin Laden as the man as to the ideology of militant Islam. Bin Laden's organisation is not a centrally directed terrorist organisation in the traditional model. Rather, it's more a clearinghouse from which other terrorist groups elicit funds, training and logistical support. It constantly changes shape according to the whims of its leader. Nor is this the single font of all terrorist evil. Rather, it's an informal network of networks across a dozen countries whose members draw on each other for assistance and support. In a war against terrorism, the bin Laden organisation may prove to be only the first target. No one can be enthusiastic or cavalier in threatening military action. 
but it's clearly necessary. The form it will take is yet to be determined, as indeed is Australia's precise commitment. What is clear, however, is that the task of eliminating the threat posed by terrorist groups such as these will require much more than airstrikes or attacks by special forces. First and foremost, it's the job of intelligence and law enforcement to identify the extent of the terrorist networks and locate the organisation's centre of gravity. This will be a very challenging and difficult task. Osama bin Laden was declared Washington's most wanted criminal in August 1998, more than three years ago now. Many millions of dollars and many thousands of people have already been committed to the task of bringing him to account for the US Embassy bombings in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. Successful action against this terrorist threat will also be critically dependent on building and maintaining the broadest possible international coalition against terrorism. President Bush and his advisers are clearly very well aware of the vital nature of this task. Securing the act active cooperation of Islamic states, notably Pakistan, is obviously very challenging. We should be very mindful of the potential long-term political consequences of such cooperation. The terrorists certainly hope to destabilise Islamic governments who cooperate with the West. But without such assistance, the task of hunting down those responsible for this mass terrorism will be much more difficult, and the risks of adverse consequences all the greater. This is going to be a very difficult balance to strike. International cooperation must also extend to the worldwide effort to identify and close down the web of financial arrangements which has given the Bin Laden organisation its global reach and capacity for mass violence. For our part, Australia should set an example by moving without further delay to sign and ratify the two latest international conventions against terrorism, especially the 1999 International Convention for the Suppression of Financing of Terrorism. Finally, we must also recognise, as the New York Times noted last week, terrorism is a global threat. Part of the challenge is to recognise that the roots of terrorism lie in economic and political problems in large parts of the world. Terrible economic and political problems abound in the present context, which includes the hatreds of the Middle East. They will not be solved by military action, either on the scale of the Gulf War or the nature of a so-called surgical strike against the backers of last Tuesday's attacks. In this regard, I think it timely to, reiter to reiterate the thrust of remarks I made in this House more than three years ago in speaking to the motion related to the possible military action against Iraq. Back at that time, in March 1998, I observed that given the trend in Arab public opinion and its perception of Western double standards, it was incumbent upon all members of the international community, including Australia, to do everything we could to encourage a resumption of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process and to resolve each of the other outstanding Middle East issues. A Middle East policy perceived, whether rightly or wrongly, as one just focused on Western interests, will ultimately fail to secure the necessary international and regional support. It would be a pyrrhic victory indeed if we successfully hunt down those immediately responsible for these terrible atrocities, but fail to find a lasting solution to the wider problems of peace, security and justice throughout the Middle East. Last year, to the dismay of everyone, the Middle East peace process collapsed and violence has followed on a weekly and daily basis ever since. Terrorism will not disappear until the international community eliminates not only the terrorists but also the roots of terrorism. Last Tuesday's attacks introduced a whole new class of terrorism. The next step in this terrible escalation of violence may well be the use of chemical, biological or possibly nuclear weapons. We must understand that we simply cannot afford to fail, to fail either militarily or diplomatically in meeting the challenge of mass terrorism. The question is that the motion be agreed to the Leader of the House, the Minister for Defence. Uh, Mr Speaker, I totally and fully support the resolution moved by the Prime Minister and seconded by the Leader of the Opposition and wish, of course, to be uh, 
uh, fully associated with it, Mr Speaker. Words are inadequate to express the sense of shock and horror that I know so many Australians, all Australians, have felt. Words are simply inadequate uh, to fully express the sense of sympathy and shared loss, which is also felt by so many Australians. Words simply cannot express adequately the sense of shared loss for those Australians, those Australian families who today wait anxiously uh, for the gravest of news. And words can never adequately express our sense of admiration in the words of the motion before the parliament today for the courageous efforts of those engaged in the dangerous rescue operation still underway. Uh, Mr Speaker, as Minister for Defence, I today want to take my opportunity to uh, focus on some matters which are perhaps more of a defence nature than uh, might be the remit of others. I first want to personally express my sympathy to Defence Secretary Don Rumsfeld, uh, who was here in Australia this year with Colin Powell uh, for what were very successful meetings of ministers under the auspice of the regular Osmin dialogue. Um, it was no surprise to me, having met the man, to hear of the reports of his own involvement uh, in the Pentagon. But I, I mentioned Don Rumsfeld and, and, and extend my personal um, thoughts and wishes and prayers to him and to his team uh, for another reason, and that is that for me personally, and I hope for Australians generally, uh, it is a matter of some reassurance that at the heart of the American government we have people of the calibre of Don yeah, Rumsfeld. Yeah, yeah. He made a great impression, as did of course Colin Powell when he yeah. was here, uh, but it is terribly important that we have, and I think that Australians know, that we have friends at the heart of government in America, but more importantly than that, we have people with experience and wisdom to deal with the many challenges which are going to face us. Uh, Mr Speaker, I suppose of all the words that have been spoken uh, in the days and hours and moments since uh, uh, this unspeaker, these unspeakable acts were committed, um, the ones that still resonate with me were the words of George Bush, who showed real leadership in the words that he uttered when he said that freedom had been attacked and freedom will be defended. Because when all is said and done, it is absolutely the truth of the matter that justice must be done uh, in response to these outrageous acts of criminality. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, we must, of course, play our role in that. But when he said that freedom must be defended, he really, I think, encapsulated the fact that this attack on American soil was an attack on the values and freedoms which underpin our society. In fact, when you think of our society, there can be nothing more important than the abiding values which give this society its character and ultimately which give people their freedoms to grow as people, to prosper as people and to reach their full potential as individual human beings. And so it is, Mr Speaker, that uh, on that terrible night here in Australia, as the first reports came through, one of the first responses back from the Australian government, of course, uh, our Prime Minister was there in Washington, but from the Canberra end, as the phone calls went back and forward, uh, our people at the military level and at the central level in Canberra, one of the first responses to the US was to say, we are with you and whatever we can do as a society we are keen and anxious and ready to do. Mr Speaker, uh, what are we doing? Well, in response to that uh, immediate uh, offer of ours and, of course, the very strong statements that our own Prime Minister uh, made whilst he was in Washington, there have already been opportunities uh, for Australia to play its role. Uh, over, uh, over the last few days, we've had uh, uh, a request from the United States for the 
extension of the deployment of HMAS ANZAC in the Persian Gulf, uh, undertaking uh, sanctions duties. That's not the first deployment of that sort that we've had in that region. Uh, I suspect not the last. Uh, we, of course, readily agreed to the extension of that deployment for eight days or thereabouts. Mr. Speaker, it gives me the opportunity to say, because I've had reports in respect of HMAS ANZAC, that the work that that ship and its crew have undertaken in recent times has been of the absolute highest professional quality. And as Defence Minister, it makes me proud to think that when there's a job to be done, we have the people who can do the job at the very highest level, professional standard level. Uh, we were also asked for uh, some assistance with a Hercules aircraft, which we had in the US, and of course that was given without a moment's hesitation. Uh, a transport aircraft able to ferry uh, emergency workers and the like. It, is, it should also not be forgotten that Australia at any point in time has various Australian Defence Force personnel uh, in various units throughout the United States Defence Force. And our thoughts are with them, uh, not, uh, not knowing in many cases what they are doing today, but our thoughts are with them as they participate uh, with uh, their colleagues in the United States as part of, as part of those ongoing exchange arrangements. And one other area where we have uh, been immediately involved, and I don't go into any details, of course, is in the intelligence area, but we, of course, do have very close relations with the US and have had for many years, and that's a day-by-day, moment-by-moment -moment, uh, relationship where, again, we can provide practical assistance in the work which is still ahead of us. Mr Speaker, um, it is, of course, the case uh, that we've not had evidence, uh, facts or reason or otherwise, uh, to have particular concerns in Australia about the security environment. But as the Prime Minister has said on a number of occasions, the fact is that no one is immune from this sort of terrorist behaviour. And it is therefore as a matter of sensible precaution that as soon as the reports came in, the National Anti-Terrorist Plan was put in place. We've heightened security around the uh, the personnel and, and property of uh, uh, the US in Australia. We've increased security and the like around defence establishments and in the aviation sector. All of those are sensible precautionary uh, measures that have been taken. Again here, this also requires a significant effort uh, by members of the Australian Defence Force as well as uh, law enforcement agencies. And I want to put on, my, on the record my appreciation for the work uh, that those people are already undertaking on our behalf. Mr Speaker, uh, it is true that this uh, terrorist act, or these acts, to mark a form of war uh, of the dimension of which we have never seen before. But it is also the fact that in recent years there has been a lot of discussion with, uh, within defence and within security organisations to the effect that in the future the security risks that we may face may be as much terrorist acts and the like rather than the more conventional warfare of which we uh, have had experience sadly in the past. As a result of that, I am able to say to the House that in recent years the Australian government has made uh, a number of uh, changes, policy changes, to reflect a changing security profile with which we have to deal. Australia's special forces have all the tools they require to do their job uh, in the modern counter-terrorist world. Over the past six years, the government has continuously built up the special forces capability, particularly with respect to counter-terrorism, ship underway response, clearance diving teams, special forces helicopter capabilities and in intelligence uh, support. And, of course, uh, within uh, uh, the other areas of the ADF, significant funds have been provided through the White Paper for the decade ahead uh, as we uh, have made uh, further efforts to ensure that we have a capability to deal with these situations. And in the international community, as there's been some discussion briefly about uh, conventions and the like, Australia has been very active within the United Nations to draw these conventions and international law together to ensure that we have the jurisdiction to deal with terrorism 
I, of course, uh, completely support the resolution and commend it, of course, to the House. Yeah, yeah. Question is the motion be agreed to? The honourable member for Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, like uh, many of us and those that have spoken already, I don't think uh, we'll ever forget where we actually were last Tuesday evening when this terrible act of terrorism was perpetrated on the United States. In my own case, I was uh, attending uh, a Dragons medal presentation of the football club that both the Prime Minister and I support. And uh, I, I, I got home after that uh, function, and uh, my phone, my mobile phone, was ringing, and text messages from my daughter who had been watching television break, and my staff down here. And of course, like most of us that were in Australia at the time, uh, we sat up and watched uh, the events unfolding. And who could forget the images that flowed from that time? Images of uh, the jets crashing into the World Trade Centre. Images of bodies falling, as somebody said, like, uh, like confetti out the window as people sought to escape the dreadful heat and the smoke and, and the other devastation that had already taken place in the upper floors of the World Trade Centre. Who could forget the image of uh, uh, once the towers had collapsed, uh, at the video taken by that doctor who continued to film and said, I hope I survived this as all the rubble came down upon him immediately did survive. He said on his own tape, I think I've survived, now I've got to go and help someone else. Who could forget the 67-year-old who said, thank God I could still run? Who can forget the images of the volunteers, the construction workers that were down the road, that simply said there's a job to be done, I've got to get in there? And these are the images that I think that are enduring for us all. These are the images that tell us something about the human spirit and the way that it will respond to tragedy. And these are the images that we continue to see on our television screens, in our newspapers, that we hear about through uh, the radio media. And of course, what it has done is cement in the psyche of all of us, I think, forever, concerns about the frailty of human nature and, as, as, as others have said in this debate already this afternoon on this condolence motion, our resolve to do something about terrorism. I think it's interesting, Mr Speaker, as uh, in years past when I had uh, the position that you now hold, I attended a number of IPU meetings. And at every one of those IPU meetings, invariably, there are resolutions on the table about terrorism and what parliaments of the world can do to stamp out terrorism. And I've got to tell you, in the three years that I attended those meetings, which probably amounted to about six, those same resolutions kept rolling around. But I've got to say, each year when I fronted up, there didn't seem to be a lot that had been done by members of the parliaments of this world that attended those IPU conferences to stamp out terrorism. This particular event, I think, may, may at least resolve some of those problems at a parliamentary level into the future. But the most immediate concern, of course, of us all is what response is going to come from the world community. As the Prime Minister has said, as the Leader of the Opposition has said, the United States' response to date has been measured. It has been full of anger, understandably so, but the words that have come from the leaders of that great nation have left no one in any other mind than justice will be done. On this side of the parliament, we have supported the Prime Minister, we have supported the government, we have supported Australia in the attitudes that we have adopted. It's interesting when you think that some 69 Australians are still missing, many of those are presu presumed, I think, dead as a result of this catastrophe. It's interesting also that many of us have been touched by events of people that we knew that were there. I mean, I, there's one article that appeared in the Illawarra Mercury this week, a uh, hellish start to Jason's new job, but goes on to tell the story of a young man, his second day working on Wall Street uh, for a finance company, but was in the vicinity of the, the World Trade Centre. His father is a personal friend of mine, in fact, he's my accountant. It goes on to say how he ran out of the district was covered in, in the dust and the grime and so on, jumped in a taxi cab and then a huge girder came crashing down in the back of the taxi cab in which he got. And uh, he survived. I mean, he got away. But that's yet again another example. In this case, it was young Jason Keisha uh, in Wollongong. 
another uh, constituent of mine, uh, actually the brother of the person from the Democrats who stood against me at the last election, was there, and he too was in harm's way but was able to survive. The concerns, I think, of each of these people, or the, the, the stories of each, these people identifies for us all, is the concern of every Australian. That is, we have loved ones, and the last thing we want to see is that in some way their life is tragically cut short because of some inhumane terrorist activity. And if we feel that here, we can only imagine what Americans feel like. Those people that have lost loved ones, those people, as was said, the moms and dads, those people that were brothers, were sisters, each of those had a long, fulfilling life to look forward to, and now they don't. But I think one of the other things that's important here that we must always uh, turn our attention to again, and I'm so pleased that both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition made comment about this, that is that terrorism knows no religion no race, no colour, no creed. We may well read, we may hear people talk about Muslims if it is as if it is an all-embracing group of people that embrace terrorism and are supportive of what's happened. Clearly that's not the case, whether it's Palestine or whether it's in Australia. That is not the case. And indeed, as the Leader of the Opposition said to the caucus this morning, Basques the IRA, the Shining Path, indeed, Tim McVeigh. I don't think any of those groups, particularly, are Muslim by religion. They are not. And so I think it uh, behoves us all in this place, as we represent this great nation of ours, to recall that we have embraced people from every different background to this country, and they have sought to live here, and they have sought to live here in peace and in harmony. But as I think the Minister for Defence just remarked upon a moment ago, the fact that uh, to this extent Australia has been free of terrorism, that does not mean that we should rest on our laurels. That does not mean that we should let our guard down. Just as I think what has happened to the United States has meant that the guard of any freedom-loving country, indeed any country in the world, should let its guard down. I mean, how often have we all in this place come and spoken to our friends about a bomb that's gone off in the centre of Jerusalem, about something that's happened uh, in Germany or in France or in Italy or somewhere else in the world where, or in Turkey, where an act of terrorism has taken place and we've said, oh, isn't it shocking, but gee, thank goodness it's over there. Well, thank goodness, yes, to an extent, but no longer. I think, as has been so eloquently said, by the leaders of the United States, by the ambassador of the United States to Australia in that moving speech, that commemoration speech that he delivered this afternoon, have pointed out again and again, innocence has been lost. We have all experienced some major changes, but I think equally what we've got to think about is Australia's commitment and that commitment, whether it be in a military sense, whether it be in a, a, a diplomatic sense, is unequivocal. Both sides of parliament recognise that, and we do so on behalf of the Australian people. But I think what we've also got to remember is that uh, within the capabilities that Australia possesses, that that commitment has to be careful, it has to be thought through, and what it has to do, of course, is to maximise Australia's effort to ensure that those terrorists pay, for the, pro pay the price for uh, the terrible tragedy that was New York, last, uh, New York, Washington and indeed Pennsylvania last week. It frightened me the other day. In fact, I think it was Saturday night. I was driving my daughter, age 14, and her, one of her friends to a, to a disco, school disco, and a friend said to me, do you think we're about to have World War III? My dad's been talking about this and he's watched it on television. And I said to her, no, I don't. I think what we've had in this past week is a demonstration of man's inhumanity to man, that people, for whatever reason, have taken upon themselves to destroy a sense of community that was the United States and is by definition the world. But I said to this little girl, no, I don't think we're in World War III. But I did say also that the United States, her allies, 
would look to seek justice for what had happened. I think each of us in this place needs to be assured that that justice that is sought is appropriate justice and that the fears of that little girl and her father are not realised through some terrible tragedy down the track. It was a dreadful day. There is no doubt about that. The ramifications we continue to see on a daily and a nightly basis. I lend my support entirely to the resolution that's been moved. Question is the motion be agreed to. The Honourable the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I too rise to support the motion moved by the Prime Minister and supported by the Leader of the Opposition. And Mr. Speaker, uh, those of us who will never forget the sight of an aeroplane going into the World Trade Centre know that we've seen a great evil. We've seen evil in our midst which has been organised in a way which we've not seen before, which was coordinated in a way which many of us still find unbelievable. And it was of a scale that we find hard to imagine. We've seen great evil conveyed to us through television as it happened. And we're reminded again that evil lives within our midst all of the time. And it brings killing and death. And our hearts are heavy as we think of those that have died and their families who have lost and the indescribable sadness, the waste of life that arose out of these incidents. The thing about evil is that it's indiscriminate. Those who kill based on hate or fanaticism don't have any regard for the people who are their victims. They don't have any regard for those that are living their everyday lives. And that's why it's been said that this is an attack on civilization because it's an attack on the right of people to go about ordinary lives without being killed. Undoubtedly, those who perpetrated this wrong thought they were bringing down the financial system or punishing captains of industry. But we know that they killed cleaners, clerks, telephonists, men, women, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Americans, and not just Americans, they killed Australians too. Terrorists don't make much of a distinction when it comes to indiscriminate killing. An attack on civilian people who planned no war, no military strike, but were just going about their ordinary lives, going to their offices, doing their jobs, creating a work environment. But for those who killed them, they undoubtedly targeted what they saw as a symbol of economic pro progress in the World Trade Centre and of constitutional government in seeking to attack the White House or the Pentagon. Mr Speaker, although we've seen great evil in our midst, we've seen a great triumph of the human spirit. And how often is that the case? That the worst in human beings brings out the best in human beings. That the worst killing of the terrorist brings out the greatest bravery of the firefighter and the policeman and our leaders. And it reminds us again that those values that can pull us down will only be transcended if we defend those values which will elevate us and lift us up. Ours, like the American society, is an open society. You can travel where you want, when you want. You don't need permission. Terrorists don't like open societies, even though they seek to take advantage of them. They don't believe that people should have freedom of movement, conscience, decision. In fact, that's one of the values that brings them to have contempt for our kind of societies. And it's one of the reasons why we have to defend our kind of society. If we don't defend the open society, if we should lose sight of what keeps us together and makes us distinctive and gives us that quality of life, then the terrorists, to a degree, will triumph. 
And let us take from this incident a determination to not let them triumph, not one inch, not in one respect. The defenders of the open society might be slowly roused, but when they are, they act decisively. And the US government might be slowly roused, but when it acts, it must act decisively in favour of the open society to defend those values which we know are good and right, lest they fall victims to those which we know are evil and wrong. To the people of the United States, to the grieving relatives, to the friends of our fellow Australians, we pay our condolences, we reaffirm our commitment to the values of our society and our commitment to our ally in the steps that it will take to defend those values and to make sure that no triumph, no victory will come to those who have perpetrated a great evil and a great wrong. <laughs> Question is the motion be agreed to. The honourable member for Chisholm. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I stand here today to speak of a motion none of us could have imagined one week ago. It has already been said many times the calamity that occurred last Tuesday will change the world forever. It appears that up to 5,000 innocent lives have been ended in the terrorist attacks on Washington, D.C., New York and Pennsylvania. This includes residents of over 40 nations, including a potential of over 70 Australians, potentially one of our great losses of Australians at one single event—5,000 people caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. The World Trade Center is in ruins and the Pentagon severely damaged. Our sense of security has been shattered and, for some momentarily, our belief in the humanitarian of our fellow man. But as awful as this tragedy is, it has not shaken our belief in our shared goals of democracy and freedom. Our commitment to the pursuit of peace and freedom has not been wavered. If anything, these terrorist attacks have created a greater yearning for unity and for an appreciation of not what divides us but what unites us as all, hum as all human beings. There have been so many poignant stories that have emerged from Tuesday's tragedies. Stories of great courage and hope, selfishness and the triumph of human spirit. And as the rescuers sift through the wreckage in New York, we all hope for the miraculous discovery of more survivors, which leads me to pay tribute to the emergency service workers who have so bravely, bravely risked their lives running into buildings crumbling before their very eyes. It is estimated that over 200 firefighters and police officers were killed when the burning Twin Towers collapsed. This horrific figure is a very sobering reminder of the real dangers emergency workers face every day in the dispensation of their duties. As a wife and an ambulance officer, I am well aware of the hazardous nature of the jobs of emergency workers. Their ongoing search for survivors and the grim task of recovering what is left of those that have fallen is perhaps the most terrible, yet at the same time the most important task, particularly for those grieving families hoping against hope that they have not been bereaved by this horrific incident. I would like to join with the other speakers in renewing Australia's commitment to joining the International Coalition Against Terrorism. We must do with all, all within our power to bring those responsible for this horrendous crime to heal. As President Bush has said, it is not only the organisations behind this attack that should be punished, but any state that provides substance to those so-called terrorist cells. It is crucial that, on the basis of irrefutable evidence, that the organisers of these acts are identified and brought to justice. But I would like to also urge calm in the wake of this tragedy. To do anything less would be to dishonour those whose lives have been ir so irreversibly been changed. Whilst it would be understandable, we must not approach this with an uncontrollable sense of revenge and anger. Only a US-led response that is considered, measured and supported by a broader coalition of states will begin to counter the evil of terrorism. To do anything else will be to play into the terrorists' hands and to diminish us all. Australians and Americans have much in common. We are both relatively young countries. We are both multicultural countries that have opened our door to thousands of people made homeless by the ravages of war, natural disaster and persecution. We are both countries that fought the excessive of Nazism and Japanese, Japanese during World War II. And we are both countries with a fierce democratic tradition where freedom is cherished. The US came to our aid during World War II and they remained our most important ally. As the American people come to terms with this attack, I've been impressed by the calls by, by leaders both here and in the US for tolerance in dealing with our fellow citizens of, ethnic, of different ethnic backgrounds. To date, there have been a few isolated instances of racism, racist acts against our local Muslim communities. We must deplore this act. For any Australian to, to, to indulge in the scapegoating of a particular race demeans us all. 
If we are to prove that these attacks may have harmed our people but not broken our spirits, these racist acts must end. As the American ambassador put it so well at today's memorial service, no true person of faith could have been behind this act. These terrorists bastardised the very religious religions they claim to worship in the pursuit of their fanatical ideas, grudges and obsessions. Whether they are adherents of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism or Hinduism, no faith condones the taking of life. So I join with other members in calling for all Australians to refrain from stereotyping on Muslim communities. There are parts of the mosaic of Australian society, and we know their leaders share in our sorrow for these devastating events. It has been said before, these attacks on America are really an attack on freedom everywhere and must be defended. I formally extend my condolences to the American people and all those who have been hurt here in Australia and across the world. It is my hope that the bond has developed amongst the citizens of the world in reaction to this horror can be a springboard for a more tolerant and compassionate world. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr Deputy. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, all Australians join with our American friends and allies in this time of grief and shock, and all Australians condemn those responsible for these most atrocious and heinous terrorist attacks. The indiscriminate use of violence with total disregard for innocent life is the hallmark of terrorism, and the attacks on the United States mark a watershed in the scale intensity and brutality of such violence. The fanaticism and hatred that drive terrorism are always frightening. In this case, as in so many others throughout history, the name of the Almighty is invoked. But no God, no religion, be it Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam or Judaism, preaches wanton violence and destruction. Because of this, the terrorism we've just seen represents an assault on all fundamental human values. The Australian government and the Australian people, like the rest of the international community, want to see those responsible for these atrocities brought to justice. While we cannot yet be certain, there is evidence that the attacks in the United States were the work of the Osama bin Laden organisation. It will take some time for the investigation to be completed. No doubt a complex network of interrelationships between those responsible will be re revealed. But what has happened demonstrates that terrorism of any manifestation represents a threat that knows no borders. Terrorism is an attack on all decent people of all races and all religions. Not knowing exactly who is responsible for these attacks, we must not rush to retribution, but we must do all we can to ensure that justice is done. We must also avoid the trap of assuming guilt through assumed association. And I, like others, am distressed by reports that Australian Muslim and Arabic communities are being subjected to violence and vilification on the basis that they're somehow associated with the perpetrators of the United States attacks. Such incidents merely play into the hands of those who, like terrorists, do not share civilised democratic values. But I call on Australians to promote tolerance, decency and inclusion to all members of the Australian community. We're not presently able to conduct a detailed analysis of what all this may mean internationally and for Australia. The horrific events are of such a magnitude that it will take some time to comprehend fully the issues that will need to be examined over the coming months. Indeed, it will be essential for the examination to be undertaken with a cool mind and a steely resolve. However, we can say with certainty that what happened in the United States on the 11th of September 2001 has fundamentally changed the global environment in which we live and the impact will reverberate for years to come. As a civilised people and as a civilised nation, we owe it to our fellow, fellow Australians murdered in the United States and to the hundreds, thousands of other innocent people from other countries who died to stand with the people of the United States in this time of need. Our memorial to their death must be a renewed, determined and sustained commitment to the elimination of terrorism. Anything less would be a betrayal of their memory. We must make the commitment to the elimination of terrorism in the certain knowledge that it will not be easy. There will be setbacks, there will be pain, and we must be acutely aware that our own active involvement in the fight could well bring terrorism closer to our own shores. But the enormity of the challenge laid down on the 11th of September leaves decent people the world over with no other choice. It's not a fight of our choosing. It is, however, a fight in which we must join and in which we must win. 
Australians will need to work carefully and systematically through the implications for our own security and counter-terrorism arrangements. As is the case after any international security incident, we will, of course, review our security and, and intelligence procedures. We will do so not in panic or because we believe there are fundamental weaknesses, but because it is the sensible and wise thing to do at this time. We will do so with an open mind to ensure that we have the best possible arrangements for our own circumstances. The Australian people would expect no less. I know the dedicated men and women who work in Australia's intelligence community, in law enforcement and in protective security policy and coordination will embrace and meet the challenge. They have and deserve our full support. There has been much discussion about security and an open and democratic society. The two are not incompatible. Indeed, it is essential that we do not lose sight of the fact that it is our very democratic traditions which, at the end of the day, provide our strongest defence against the evils of the intolerance, bigotry and in inhumanity enshrined in terrorism. Mr Speaker, I fully support the motion before the House. Well, the question is that the motion be agreed to. The honourable member for Fraser. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I, of course, support the motion that's before the House. Quite properly, the bulk of the debate uh, has related to the need for an international response to terrorism. And in the immediate, I, like other speakers, endorse the views reflected in this motion and in the longer term I endorse the 10-point plan against terrorism released recently by the Leader of the Opposition. This is a circumstance that needs continuing bipartisan support. The consequences of these events will spread far beyond this year's election. I am encouraged in supporting those remarks and the resolution by the speech made by the United States Ambassador this afternoon in which he led me to have confidence that the United States response will be proportionate and sensible and discriminating and let us all hope that it is. But I wish today to focus my remarks on the domestic aspects and consequences of the recent events as also reflected in the, in the tone of the resolution. I was struck, listening as I'm sure we all have been, to television and radio commentary about these tragic events by remarks by a former FBI director of counter-terrorism who was being interviewed about and was quite properly articulating a series of measures he felt needed to be taken to strengthen the hand of the United States government against terrorism. And he made it clear in his remarks that Notwithstanding his strong views on that matter, it was fundamental to his views that nothing that was done to counteract terrorism should be done at the price of American civil liberties. And surely, if the, a former FBI director of counterterrorism, with the understandable focus on the priority of action against terrorism, can see the need to protect civil liberties in while pursuing the struggle against terrorism, we should do no less. And it's very important that all of us here as members of parliament and throughout the community as Australians in the heated climate in the lead up to this election, that we don't do or say anything that would divide rather than unite our nation. In fact, while I recognise that sometimes controversy surrounds government communications campaigns, it seems to me that there would be no controversy about an active government campaign against racism. That's a, that's a campaign which I would be pleased to support. In concluding my remarks, I want to refer back to remarks that were made the last time the parliament, although I was then in the Senate, was debating a similar resolution. It was a debate around the Gulf War. It was then, uh, these were the remarks made at that time. There's scarcely a party which has ever been in government or seriously aspired to government in any democracy, and I paraphrase slightly, which does not support resolutions of the nature we are supporting today. There's uni universal support amongst parties which pursue democratic processes. We hope that what is now developing will be carried out with the least possible loss of life and human suffering. We don't endorse these resolutions with enthusiasm for the battle. 
but merely a grim determination to do that which we do not wish to do, but which we feel needs to be done. And if we don't back appropriate measures in response as required, as outlined by the Foreign Minister, by decisions already of the United Nations, we'll fall back to the circumstance where all we have is pious resolutions with which all people of goodwill concur but which dictators and aggressors can ignore with impunity. Without a firm, sensible and proportionate response to this act of terrorism, there will be no peace, because it's very important that we never forget that, as has been said by people more famous than I, peace is more than the mere absence of war. It is a state beyond merely refraining from taking military action. We must be prepared to act in difficult circumstances in response to these acts of terrorism. Therefore, I support the motion. Questions the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Robinson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In uh, everyone's life, there are only three or four events, probably, that uh, you always remember where you were at the time, and uh, no matter what else happens, they have a significant impact in your life. In my lifetime, there have been three events like that. The first was on the 22nd of November 1963 when uh, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. The second event was the 20th of July 1969 when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. And of course the third event was uh, tragically last Tuesday, September the 11th, 2001, when I, like thousands of other Australians, sat through the night transfi transfixed in horror at the events that were unfolding before our very eyes. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's been a week of extreme emotions where we have witnessed the worst of humanity and we've also witnessed the very best of humanity, the strength, the heroism and the compassion. I wish to express my condolences on behalf of all my constituents of Robertson to the families and friends of all those people from 40 nations uh, who have been uh, killed or injured in New York, Washington or Pennsylvania. Uh, particularly to the families of uh, those 70 Australians who are missing uh, and unfortunately now presumed that they may have been killed. There have been spontaneous outpourings of uh, grief and sympathy by the residents of the Central Coast, such as the, the God Bless America signs that have uh, suddenly appeared along the F3 freeway, the 2,000 people that attended the memorial service on Terrigal Beach at very short notice on Saturday and the thousands of other Central Coast residents who attended church services throughout the Central Coast yesterday. Australia and USA have very strong bonds. They are strong and they, and they are an enduring friendship. Less than two weeks ago I had the privilege of attending the launch of a new book by my friend and Central Coast resident and internationally renowned Australian photographer Ken Duncan. This launch took place at the home of the new American Consul General in Sydney, uh, Eileen Malloy, who graciously opened her home for the launch of this magnificent book uh, on the beauty of the USA. This particular book was actually taken by our Prime Minister John Howard as a gift to President Bush on his recent trip, and I do hope that he did have an opportunity to present the book to him. It's by an, an internationally recognised Australian photographer, and it is a book take well, photos of the beauty of the USA. And I think this book now becomes a symbol of the friendship of the bonds between Australia and the USA. And I had the opportunity when speaking to the Consul General to discuss what depth we have in our friendship between Australia and America. And many of us would have seen President Bush just after he had met with Prime Minister John Howard before the terrible events of September the 11th when he called to the, the uh, assembled media and said it's great to have friends who will tell you the truth. And that is what the friendship is so strong with Australia and the USA that we can discuss issues frankly. We can dis disagree on some things but at the end of the day we are um, strong friends and the relationship between Australia and the USA uh, will go on to be, continue to be a, a very strong relationship. Mr Deputy Speaker, those, those bonds of friendship between our two nations are very strong and all Australians will stand side by side with our American friends to fight against terrorism. Mr Deputy Speaker, terrorism must not succeed, terrorism will not succeed 
and democracy in the free world will stand against terrorism and Australia will stand against terrorism for the sake of our future and for the sake of the future of our children. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Honourable Member for Franklin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. New York is a wonderful city and New York is wonderful people. I've been fortunate to visit this amazing place several times as I have my brother Bob and his wife Sue and their four children living close handy in New Jersey. Like many in this place, I visited the landmarks of New York, clambered up the steps of the Empire State Building and the Statue of Liberty, and stood in awe looking at the towering heights of what were once the World Trade Twin Towers. I have very pers personal close links with the United States of America. My Auntie May was one of the first American war brides to settle in the USA during World War II. Her late husband, Bill, an American Marine, fought in the Pacific, especially at Guadalcanal. And their children, Judy, Dale, Greg and Kim, and their families have made me and my family very welcome during our various sojourns over there in the United States. My sister-in-law, Sue, her late father, Red Regan, was a fire chief and during my first visit to New York in 1974 I was lucky and privileged to witness the obvious camaraderie and fellowship of the firefighters working in that part of the United States of America. Last week's tragedy, witnessed by so many Australians on their TV screens last Tuesday night and early into Wednesday morning, brought home to all of us the devastation capable from the minds of depraved individuals intent solely on wreaking havoc on innocent individuals going about their daily lives. I can imagine New York that morning, tourists seeing the sights, New Yorkers enjoying a morning coffee and newspaper, couples planning their future lives, workers going about their daily tasks in their offices. We can imagine it all taking place. Nothing out of the ordinary, daily life in another big metropolis. The sight of aircraft slamming into twin towers repeated time after time, angle after angle, seemed surreal. Most of us have been desensitised after seeing so many disaster movies based in downtown New York. It wasn't until we saw those twin towers collapsing and the hundreds of workers desperately trying to save themselves, and then that huge cloud of debris rushing down the streets, did one realise that this was fair income, and that death and tragedy had hit in the most horrific circumstances. My first reaction was to question why. Why now, and why in such a an horrific way? Today, most of us were privileged to attend a very special service in the Great Hall and to hear the message of hope by the American ambassador. This message, in a time of tragedy and deep grief for so many people in so many countries throughout the world. And as I read the Australian newspaper today and saw that long column of so many countries affected by this horrific act. It brought home to me the anguish and grief and obvious desolation in so many families throughout so many countries in this world. It happened in America, but it had an enormous impact throughout the world. As the days unfold and talk of retaliation to render a response to this barbaric terrorism is in everyone's minds, one can but wonder where the future lies. I especially feel for my brother Bob and my sister-in-law Sue, as their eldest son Seamus has been called up by the Marines for potential future deployment. I hope and pray that those touched by this tragedy can be comforted somewhat by what is said in this place today. To the Australian families suffering at this time, I offer my heartfelt condolences to them all. Mr Deputy Speaker, I fully support the motion before the House. The Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise today in support of the motion 
which is in relation to the horrendous events that we all witnessed last week. Events that we will all remember for the rest of our lives. They were carried out by bar barbarians bent on one thing, taking innocent lives by attacking a symbol of the free world. My condolences and on behalf of my family and the people and residents of Groom, the condolences of them, go to all those who've lost loved ones or had loved ones injured by this hideous act. Mr Deputy Speaker, we need today, as we have already on a number of occasions, give thanks and pray for the victims and their families and their friends. Australia and the US have links that will never be broken by terrorism. In fact, to the contrary, our links, as is the, as is the case now, only go, grow stronger through each, of these, uh, through each of these challenges that our nations face together. Our brave soldiers have fought together and on this occasion perhaps may again. But the message that Australians want to give to the people of America is that we will stand beside them as we have in the past. Mr Deputy Speaker, despite the horrendous images of that fateful day, the image that sticks closest in my mind is the image of the future. The image that was portrayed on yesterday's in yesterday's Sunday papers and again today in, the, uh, in one of the uh, weekly news magazines. Mr Speaker, it is that, Im that, is, it is that image of the free world that is contained in the sp Star Spangled Banner. It is the image of the American flag still flying despite everything that's happened, in this case still flying above the ashes of the World Trade Centre. Mr Speaker, I support this resolution as I and I know everyone in this House supports freedom and I look forward to the day in which this House continues to support freedom with the, with the bipartisanship as we have today. Thank you. Order. The question is the motion moved by the Prime Minister relating to terrorist attacks in the United States of America be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Wills. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise both to support the motion and to offer the condolences of the electorate of Wills, uh, our sense of distress and sadness, and our condolences to the families and friends of those who have been murdered, who have lost their lives in what is a cowardly and despicable and contemptible act of terrorism. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, this is indeed an act of terrorism which has diminished us all, which will change our world for the worse, uh, which will generate a sense of insecurity, of fear, uh, and it will challenge the tolerance, uh, sense of democracy and respect for others, which has been one of the hallmarks and strengths of Australia and of our community. Uh, I would urge people, both in my electorate of wills and in the broader Australian community, to stick with tolerance. Uh, part of Australia's great strength is that we are a proudly multicultural society, one made up of people from many different lands united in a distinctive Australian identity. Uh, let's keep it that way. Mr Deputy Speaker, if this terrorist activity is found to have been perpetrated by people of Middle Eastern or Islamic background, it does not follow that all Islamic or Middle Eastern background people are guilty of the offence any more than it would follow that uh, the rest of us are collectively guilty of, for example, the crimes of Martin Bryant at Port Arthur. And I know that many Australians of Islamic and Middle Eastern background, many of them in uh, my electorate, unreservedly condemn these terrorist outrages. And what we need to do in maintaining our tolerance is to have a dialogue with people of Middle Eastern and Islamic background about things that unite us and things that uh, indeed have the potential to divide us. One of the things I want to stress as part of that dialogue is my view that uh, there is no place in this world and certainly no place in Australia for religious fanaticism uh, of any kind. We can go back over the centuries and see uh, uh, Christian atrocities during the Crusades or 
uh, wars between Catholics and Protestants in uh, uh, Ireland and France and England and other places, and uh, the actions of Hindu fundamentalists in uh, murdering the Christian missionary Graham Staines. These sorts of things have gone on uh, over the years. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is no legitimate place for them. Uh, we believe that the role of religion is in the private and that the public sphere of politics is not the place to pursue religious objectives. We believe in freedom of religious expression and tolerance for all, no matter what their belief or faith. That necessarily carries within it separation of church and state. And Mr Deputy Speaker, as part of an ongoing political dialogue, we also need to emphasise that there can be no role for violence or terror in seeking to resolve political differences. We must go to this question of suicide bombers, of martyrdom, and say that there can be no place in any civilised society for people who are prepared to engage in or shelter or condone or excuse in any way those who engage in suicide attacks. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I urge a response uh, to this outrage, as does this resolution. But like other speakers, I urge that it not be indiscriminate. What we seek is justice, and we are entitled to engage in self-defence. Uh, we have no interest in revenge or vengeance. A successful attack on terrorism will protect the innocent while punishing the guilty. If it fails to do that, it will simply perpetrate and rekindle the cycle of violence. The world will be diminished by this, Mr Deputy Speaker, and we must all accept some privations which will flow from it. Let us resolve here that we will prevail over terrorism and the values that we hold dear—freedom, democracy, tolerance, diversity—that those values will prevail as well, and I pledge the people of Wills to this essential task. The question is the motion be agreed to the parliamentary secretary to the Minister for Industry, Science and Resources. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to uh, uh, also support, very strongly support the motion that we have before us today and uh, express my overwhelming sadness for, what, for an act that, uh, in my view, has really changed the world forever. It's impossible, it's impossible to be able to find words for this gutless uh, and cowardly and very mindless act of, of wanton violence against innocent people. And I guess it's also very impossible to be able to find words that can convey that deep sadness and uh, that uh, deep despair and overwhelming sadness that we must we feel for all that uh, have been uh, affected by by this act. Uh, certainly, uh, our, our, my heart goes out to the uh, the people of uh, the United States that are affected by this. Deepest sympathy there for this shared loss. But as it does for all those other families around the world uh, that are, and I understand, some 20 odd uh, different countries who've had citizens affected by this, in particular our own, uh, where we have some 69 missing and uh, three confirmed losses. Uh, as the uh, Prime Minister said in uh, his speech uh, earlier in the House, uh, there would be very few. Uh, that, that, that in some way uh, can't uh, relate to somebody over there that may, uh, or know somebody over there that was affected at the time, uh, by this particular uh, incident. And, uh, in my own case, I attended a wedding in January of a very happy couple that had just been advised of a position that they had uh, been appointed to at the New York Port Authority, and uh, they took up a, a job over there and uh, the uh, lady concerned was on the 71st floor, worked on the 71st floor. Um, she had to attend a, uh, a mandatory meeting off-site in Philadelphia on the day of this incident, and so fortunately she wasn't there on the day. Sadly, over 50 of her co-workers uh, lost their lives. So uh, 
right around the world, uh, <coughs> this type of thing. It certainly brings out a, a level of anger, a level of shock, a le level of disbelief. Um, it could be anybody. It, could be, it, 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 it happened there today. I think it highlighted the fact that it could happen anywhere. It could be any of us, any of our children could be affected by this type of, uh, uh, of event. It makes us really feel, uh, I guess, it takes us right out of our comfort zone. And I, and I think this is the reason why we must be very, very strong in the response. I was pleased to see uh, the Prime Minister and the Leader of Opposition uh, prepared to stand up very quickly, stand beside the United, um, United States and uh, declare very strong support. I think the action need, we need to be very targeted. We need to be able to be very specific and very sure of those that, are, that have been involved in this act, but I think we also need to make sure that I send that message out to those that have a mind to be involved in this type of activity, that it will not be tolerated by the decent citizens of, of, uh, of this world, and uh, I think we need to be very swift in our, in our response. I uh, would also like to congratulate the, the work of the uh, of the fire department, police and other emergency services over there it was just absolutely outstanding. And uh, we see it whenever there is times of need, uh, be it in the United States or in this country here, the, 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 the selfless work and the sacrifice by these people from these emergency services is just beyond description. And uh, I think that, uh, it, again, they have shown that they are really very true heroes. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the short time I have left, I hope that quickly we are able to identify those uh, and absolutely confirm those who are involved and certainly take action to make sure that this thing, that, that we have an action that is, is a sufficient deterrent to, uh, to stop this type of mindless violence from continuing in the world. We do not need it and we must do everything, stand up as citizens of the world to see that it is uh, avoided at all costs. Thank you. Order the question is the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Corio. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise in this pa parliament today, Australia's great symbol of democracy and freedom, to join with the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition in expressing uh, my condolences to the families and friends of all those who perished in the terrorist attack on New York and Washington on September the 11th. On behalf of the people of Geelong, one of Australia's great provincial cities, I particularly ex extend my condolences on the floor of this parliament to the people of the United States as the search for su survivors of this tragedy continues and that nation grieves its tragic loss of life and comes to terms with this cowardly and horrendous assault on the democratic values we commonly share. Mr Deputy Speaker, my personal association with the people of the United States goes back many, many years to 1972 when I left Australia with my then five-month-old son Adam to spend a year working and travelling in the United States. I spent that year in the city of DeKalb, Illinois and experienced firsthand the extraordinary generosity and the great love of life of the people of that the city. Those people made our stay uh, a very memorable one indeed. And my son Adam is with me in the gallery today as I extend to all Americans our heartfelt condolences at the great tragedy which has befallen their nation. I have not seen many of uh, the Americans who were such an important part of my life back then for nearly 30 years. But today, as the Australian Parliament expresses its condolence in this motion which I support, I remember the Modron family in Chicago and Peg and Jimmy Nelson and the many people in DeKalb, Illinois, who are now coming to terms with this attack on their nation and its tragic aftermath. As we all recoil in horror and disbelief at the carnage wrought by this attack, let us keep foremost in our minds that it is once again ordinary people going about their daily lives who are the casualties of this senseless and premeditated act of violence. 
among them 70 Australians who will never see their loved ones at home again. In measuring our collective response to these diabolical acts of terrorism, we must ensure that not only the masterminds of this carnage are brought to justice, but innocence is spared the suffering that often inevitably flows from a retaliation which is motivated purely by vengeance. There is a grave responsibility on those who wield such power, lest we all be dragged, honourable values and all, into the darkest abyss where barbarism eats away at our humanity and the decent values that underpins our civilised society. In Geelong we are very fortunate indeed to have many races and all the great religions represented in our community. I join with all of them, including peace -loving, the peace-loving Muslim community in Geelong, in extending to the people of the United States of America our profound sorrow at your loss. To my fellow Australians who feel a sense of fear, anger and insecurity at these events, now is the time for us to demonstrate in our own communities our deep, our deep and abiding commitment to the decent and democratic values that have been universally attacked in such a, he a heinous way in the United States. This is no time for prejudice. It is time for measured restraint. It is time to uphold in a decent, fair but just way the great values and respect for human life handed to us by our mothers and fathers down through the years. We are the guardians of future civilisation. We cannot let our children down. To the people of the United States, to the many rescue workers who have laboured intensely for survivors, to search for survivors, uh, to the families of those deceased uh, here in Australia, on behalf of the people of Geelong, I extend to you our profound condolences and sympathy. The Honourable Member for Farrah. Mr Deputy Speaker, 60 years on from World War II and all its horrors and the Holocaust, 55 years since white Russians and Cossacks were forcibly loaded by the West and sent back east to be exterminated, 25 years or thereabouts from the tragedy of the Munich Olympic Games, and 11 years since the fall of Berlin, we now have the 11th of September 2001, that horrific tragedy, the subject of this motion. Firstly, I'd just like to say there are many things that unite religions, including the Christian, Jewish and Islamic faith, and their reverence for Abraham and Moses. But there are things that are even more uniting, and that is peace and tolerance. And that's revered by Christian, Jewish, Islamic, Buddhist and Hindi. And that proves, in a sense, that the terrorists that took this action were outside the law, outside anything possibly reasonable in uh, their approach, and of course uh, outside the spectrum of any religious faith. Mr Speaker, I'd like to just uh, quote Alistair Cook, a famous uh, broadcaster who said on ABC Radio National yesterday from his base in New York, where he had survived, the end of his powerful commentary, he quoted from a spiritual hymn, America might be up and America might be down, and America might be almost in the ground, but America is not in the ground." End of quote. The United States of America is a huge economy and a population with a determination to move forward and to help the rest of the world move forward from the horrific tragedy which has taken place. The United States of America will recover from this human tragedy. It will deal with everything that arises, and I'm confident, quietly confident in saying that, and Australia will play its part, and we will, of course, do so in honour of those who have died, who have been injured, who have been so seared by, in a direct way, that which happened in Pennsylvania, New York and Washington. So, Mr Speaker, I support the condolence motion before the House. And as I prepare to depart this parliament, I extend my condolences to all the families, particularly the families of the Australian victims of this horrific carnage in the United States of America, but the victims from all around the world, many, many countries, and of course from the United States of America. But I also do so with a quiet pride 
in the response by this parliament to these very special and sad circumstances. A pride in the, the conduct of the Prime Minister very much on the spot in the circumstances in Washington right through to this day, the Leader of the Opposition, the Deputy Prime Minister, the United States Ambassador. These were memorable moments in the life of this parliament as it draws towards its conclusion. Let's hope we'll never see the same again or have the need to see the same again. I support the motion before the House. The Honourable Member for Sydney. Thank you, Mr Ac Acting Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm, I'm rise today to extend my condolences to the families of all of those who have perished in the United States, to the families of those who are still missing, and to the citizens of countries other than the United States who are also have died or are missing um, since the terrible tragedy last Tuesday. I think that uh, all members of parliament here share um, a sense of compassion for the families of those people who are either have died or are missing. And I'm a little surprised that we've been referring to this um, as President Bush has been referring to it as an act of war, because I think in a, in, a, in a way, in a terrible way, that almost cleanses the act. I think that we all know that terrible things happen in war, and yet what happened last Tuesday, I think, is more accurate, accurately described as murder. It's murder that's happened 3,000 times or 5,000 times or 10,000 times. We don't know how many times. But it's murder that's been committed again and again on one day. And um, I think it's worth remembering that the only thing that has, um, has, will stop the numbers um, continuing to grow is the, the, uh, the final um, plane load of um, terrorists was actually thwarted. We don't know how many, um, how many more people would have died had that not happened. There's no way, um, when someone is murdered, to prepare for that. Um, there's no way of understanding it. There is no logic to the act, and it's not something that any human being or any family should have to deal with um, in a lifetime. And it's worth um, thinking about the effect on a country where this happens 3,000 times or 5,000 times or 10,000 times in one day. There is an inevitable, inevitable uh, effect on a country where such a tragedy happens. And I think that really it's difficult to understand that effect fully until we see the individual photographs of people who are still missing, families who are still searching for loved ones, until we hear the stories of people trying to phone their families in their last minutes of life. That really, I think, brings home to us the, the true human tragedy of this event. I think we also wish to express compassion from this Parliament to the, the families, especially of the Australians who have died or are still missing, and also, of course, to the, um, the citizens of the 40 other nations that have been affected. Um, we express our admiration for the bravery of the rescue workers. And I know that many of my other colleagues have, have expressed admiration for this bravery, but what an extraordinary thing it is to ignore every human instinct and instead of fleeing from danger, turn around and walk into the heart of it in the hope of saving some other life. While we debate um, this condolence motion, I think that it is wise to remember also that there are, there are countries around the world where acts of terror are perpetrated on civilian populations every day. And, um, while nothing, nothing has happened um, in our recent history to match the scale of this act of terrorism, it's worth remembering that in countries such as Ireland or Spain or Sri Lanka or Egypt or in our own region, the Philippines, their citizens face this fear every day that they'll say goodbye to a loved one and never see them again because of some act of terror. Some people have drawn comparisons with um, what happened in Pearl Harbor, and yet it's wise to um, to take heed of what former Secretary of State Warren Christopher said in relation to Pearl Harbor, there is one mistake that we should not repeat when we're talking about the response, and that is after Pearl Harbor, many citizens of Japanese nationality were locked up for no reason other than they were Japanese. And in my final comments, I want to say that we, we mustn't compound the tragedy of this event by, by punishing the innocent. And when we're talking about um, pursuing Osama bin Laden perhaps in Afghanistan, Afghanistan, we have to remember 
that the, the civilians in Afghanistan have suffered perhaps more than any other people on earth, and they are suffering still from famine, from drought, from um, the, the uh, rule of a, the Taliban government. And when we set out to punish those who are responsible, it's also worth remembering not just the civilians in these countries, such as Afghanistan, but also that um, when the US seeks to punish, it sometimes, um, it sometimes makes mistakes. And when, um, when the United States initially backed the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in the hope of um, fighting communism, they, they created part of the monster that we're dealing with today. When we seek to punish, we need to be, we need to be accurate and be sure of who we are seeking to punish. Order. The question is the motion moved by the Prime Minister relating to terrorist attacks in the United States of America be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Latrobe. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the motion before the House. Those of us alive in the world today will never forget the 11th of September 2001, a despicable, calculated, premeditated, coordinated act of terrorism and murder was perpetrated on the United States of America its citizens and citizens of another 40 countries around the world. This was indeed a worldwide act of barbarism which has repulsed those human beings who believe in freedom, democracy, liberty and justice. This was not a random act of terrorism designed to frighten, but a crime so heinous as to have been a long time in the planning, executed with precision and with the objective of destroying the maximum number of buildings and the maximum number of civilians in New York City and Washington, D.C. It was calculated as well to destroy buildings which were seen by those who carried out these crimes to be stark symbols of the free world of the United States, a wealthy nation. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in a sense, I bridge the societies of the United States and Australia. Having been born in and lived in America until age 33 and having now lived in Australia for 32 years, Having been a citizen of this great nation for 27 years and a member of this House of Representatives for 11 and a half. And while in every sense of the word I am Australian, I still have many friends and of course hundreds of relatives in the USA from coast to coast and from north to south. My support for the United States in this time of crisis is not that of an ex-American but rather as an Australian, friend, neighbor, trading partner and military treaty alliance partner with the USA. The relationship between America and Australia, of course, goes back a long way, and I remind those of you here in the House today that the foundation of our Federation, our Commonwealth Government, is based on an executive drawn from the Westminster tradition and a House of Representatives as the People's House, but with a Senate styled on the U.S. model of equal representation from each state and on a High Court, which is a direct steal of the Supreme Court of the United States. The terrorist attack was not only on the United States of America, but on freedom and democracy everywhere around the world. It is possible that 90 Australians have lost their lives in this tragedy. And while their deaths occurred not on our shores, but in another country, it represents a far greater loss of life than our not so distant massacre at Port Arthur. This terrorist attack has touched our national psyche and our hearts. I have no comprehension of the bitter and twisted minds of those who would kill themselves in an effort to kill many others in the name of a religion. I think all of us know that these psychopathic killers were not religious fanatics, but simply fanatics. All of the world's great religions are founded on the basis of love and caring and a value system that helps us towards the establishment of a decent and moral society. No religion could support this kind of barbaric action. I don't know if I have lost friends, but my sister advises that my family is safe and I send them my love. My sister Carolyn and her husband Les visited this parliament when we were in session some 18 months ago and met the Prime Minister, the Treasurer, the Leader of the Opposition and many other members and senators. And I am sure many in this chamber will remember them. They are safe, but their lives have been forever touched. In July last year, Rosie and I were in New York City and traveled by ferry out to the Statue of Liberty. We prevailed upon a young Chinese gentleman to use my camera and take our photograph with Lower Manhattan in the background. 
That photo today sits on the kitchen windowsill at home, and standing stark in the background of the photograph are the twin towers of the World Trade Center, which are no more. We in this place are determined that this will not become a, a modern religious crusade against anyone or any religion, but rather a crusade against evil, ignorance, intolerance, and inhumanity. Order the question is the motion moved by the Prime Minister to be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Braddon. Mr Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the people of the northwest coast of Tasmania, who only recently faced the tragedy and the terror of Port Arthur, may I offer the sympathy and our condolences to all those people who tragically lost their lives in New York, Washington and Pennsylvania on Tuesday, the 11th of September 2001. I offer our sympathy and condolences to the family and friends of those who died. Our sympathy to those who are survivors of these terrible acts, who, like the family and friends of those who died, will live with this tragedy and pain for the future. I offer on, their, on the behalf of the people of the North West Coast respect for the courage and selfless duty of all who sought to assist the victims of these incomprehensible acts of terror to the New York New uh, Police Department, New York firefighters, the ambulance workers, the emergency services personnel and individuals, and those tragically on United Flight 93, which crashed before it could do even greater damage. Thousands of people have lost their lives in this act of terror. Some 70 of these are Australians. This act of terror affects us all. Some 40 nations had nationals killed in the terror of the 11th of September. It respected no race, religion, sex, occupation or age. This act of terror was deliberately planned and calculated to attack at the heart of Western civilisation. The United States was the location Western civilisation was the target. It is a wanton assault on common decency by attacking common people going about their ordinary daily business. And what is its purpose? Well, there is no religious goal achieved because all religions of the world abhor evil and the roots of evil. There is no religion which can be associated with what is purely evil. No national goal can be achieved because no civilisation, uh, civilised nation harbours such evil. And the national ideals and values of decency, justice, freedom and the desire for peace have been reinforced in the wake of this tragedy and reaffirmed in the United States and other democratic and freedom-seeking nations throughout the world. If the goal was to attack the heart of the economic world or a symbol of its national security, it has only achieved a worldwide movement of solidarity to maintain business as usual and reminded the world of its need to be more vigilant in the face of evil. What this calculated evil has done, apart from the wanton destruction associated with it, has highlighted two things. The first is the capacity of human beings to face evil and adversity, adver adversity head on, to demonstrate human virtue and goodness when all seems darkest. The aftermath of events in Washington and New York, New York has civilised this evil and suffering. The bravery and courage of those people has lit the torch of a coalition of nations determined to tackle terrorism head on. The second thing highlighted is the fact that terror is real. It's international and beyond boundaries of race, creed and locality. We are all vulnerable. It is not confined to isolated incidents making their way onto our television sets to be forgotten soon after except by those directly affected. This act or these acts of murder were deliberately designed to affect us all. If it was punishment for something, it delivered a maximum of physical and psychological pain, but it punished the innocent, the most vulnerable and the defenceless. This terrible act has highlighted the existence of evil in our world and the need for people of goodwill and decency to take heed of this fact and attack it with equal vigour. This act of terrorism has international victims and will have international consequences. It was internationally conspired and planned and will only be rooted out and tackled by a broad coalition of nations. There is a steely determination to bring to justice those who perpetrated this murder and to punish those who aided and abetted them. 
It is right that justice is sought and punishment brought to bear on the guilty. However, it is crucial that in the name of those who have suffered, in the name of the ideals and practices they died by, to ensure that tolerance is given equal emphasis with justice, both here and abroad. The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Deputy Speaker, I rise to support the resolution and to join in the expressions of sympathy that all Australians feel in response to the acts of horror that we have witnessed over the recent days. These were carefully planned acts of terrorism and barbarity that few in humanity thought could even be possible. Fanaticism without bounds. The power of television brought this graphic horror to our lounge rooms. It took the recreation of Hollywood to show us years later something of what had happened at Pearl Harbour, the bombing of London or Dresden, but all of us have instant memories of this event which occurred on the other side of the world. To imagine that Australians in their own households saw at the precise moment a 767 crashing for the second time into the World Trade Centre. It brought back, I think, for us all some memories, our associations personally with the United States or in other places. For me, it brought back particular memories of my own visit to the Pentagon a year or so ago. My wife and I were shown around the Pentagon by my cousin, who's a colonel in the United States Army. We were given a couple of little tags as a commemoration of that visit, presented by the Deputy Chief of Staff for operations and plans, and my wife and I took these tags with us to this morning's memorial service. I hope that the, that the general who presented these tags to us is still alive. His office was certainly destroyed. The office where my cousin worked was where the aircraft hit. Fortunately, he'd been transferred to another part of the United States uh, quite a while ago, so he was safe during this disaster. But it certainly brings back personal memories. The response around the world has been of shock and horror, anger and bitterness, sorrow and sympathy, strength and courage, and of course sacrifice and, and heroism. But there's also a determination and resolve, a resolve to seek out those who are responsible, a resolve to ensure that terrorists do not achieve their objectives of disrupting and destroying an, a nation and the enthusiasm of mankind, and a resolve also to rebuild and to resist this sort of terrorism and barbarity. The fact that three out of the four similarly conceived and executed acts of terror actually achieve their primary objective is a warning to us all how difficult it is to protect civilian life from this kind of action. If someone places no value on their own life or even regards their death as the gateway to glory, it's impossible to build an impervious wall of protection. The resolution before us today, though, is not just one of sympathy and, and commemoration. It invokes, for the first time in 50 years, the provisions of the ANZAC, ANZUS uh, agreement. When I entered Parliament, I hoped and prayed that, as a member of Parliament, I would never be asked to commit Australian troops to war or any kind of perilous action. But in my very first term, we were asked to look at issues like the Gulf War. Subsequently, we've had to deal with East Timor. And last week in Cabinet, to, to for the first time in 50 years, invoke sections four and five of ANZUS. So we need to be very conscious of the fact that this is indeed a very significant resolution before the parliament. But terrorism is a war where everyone is on the front line. We cannot assume that this commitment is merely about sending trained soldiers. It could be our houses or our offices. I was greatly moved and, uh, by the powerfully eloquent tribute of the United States Ambassador in today's memorial service. Effectively, he welded together the sympathy of, to victims and families of the people of the United States and also and Australians. But he also showed a determination to rebuild and our resolve to build a better and a safer world. This is not just 
a disaster for the United States. It's the worst peacetime loss of Australian lives at the hand of man. So this is also an Australian tragedy and we must show the same sort of resolve to fight back, to resist this sort of terror and to show that we can still be a compassionate and caring society for the betterment of all mankind. Order. The question is the motion moved by the Prime Minister to be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Rankin. As I watched the horror of the unfolding tragedy in the United States last week, I thought of mothers who would have to try to explain to their children that they would never see their dads again. And I thought of fathers who would have to try to explain to their children that they would never see their mums again. I extend my deepest sympathies to the victims of this murderous terrorism and to their families. I was delighted with the wonderful words of the American ambassador at today's service in Parliament House. He said, Americans are not a vengeful people. We will not strike out at the innocent. We cannot avenge the death of innocents through the death of innocents. If all we achieve is the death of more innocent people, we will have achieved nothing and we'll, we will have lost our humanity. We must not lose our humanity, but we must hunt down terrorists and bring them to justice. I trust the President of the United States will be guided by wisdom and compassion. And I'm encouraged by his measured response and his steely determination. I'm encouraged too by the words of the President, the Mayor of New York, the Australian Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, all of whom have said that they extend to the Islamic community the hand of friendship. As their elected representative, I extend the hand of friendship to the Islamic community of Logan City, who are a peace-loving community. So let us fight terrorism. Let us fight terrorism with wisdom. Let us retain our humanity and let us not seek to avenge the death of innocence with the death of innocence. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the Honourable Minister for Trade. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and uh, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to associate myself with the resolution moved uh, by the, uh, the Prime Minister in this uh, most uh, serious of all times that we've experienced uh, in uh, recent history in, of, the, uh, of the world. And uh, just reflecting on the events of, of last week and uh, some of the, um, the uh, I suppose, fora I've been involved in in the, uh, the last two or three months representing Australia's interests uh, with my responsibilities as the Trade Minister. And I was thinking in terms of how much um, you know, the uh, you know, global interaction between nations had changed in the last 10 or so years, a lot of the political divide and differences uh, had dissipated with the Berlin Wall. Uh, most of the interaction between most countries was based on um, a, a desire to improve the economic well-being of their societies. Uh, and one had a sense that um, at last uh, our, uh, our globe, mankind, was moving ahead um, with a view to eliminating poverty, to improving the circumstances of all peoples around the world, and of course, in large part, uh, being led by the developed economies of the world. And of course, Australia is one of those, and the United States of America is one of those. And uh, uh, it was only a matter of uh, weeks ago when we had a significant event here in Australia, the U.S.-Australian Leadership Dialogue, where a number of senior Americans were out here, participated in that dialogue with uh, senior Australians from government uh, and also from the business community in how we're going to manage the future um, economic development and growth across the world. And, uh, and then we had the tragedy of, uh, of last week, um, where uh, terrorists demolished the, the World Trade Center buildings in New York, uh, and I suppose the icons and the epitome of uh, the developed world and uh, the way that, um, that you know, the democratization of capital, of information, of technology is taking place, and how that is benefiting all the nations of the world. And I suppose the other thing, and it was. Um, I think it might have been uh, the Defence Secretary mentioned that uh, these buildings were not the New York Trade Centre, they were not the American Trade Centre, they were the World Trade Centre. 
uh, and, and also indicative of that fact are uh, the, the many different countries that had uh, nationals from their countries that uh, are still missing, um, believed killed uh, in that act of terror last week, uh, and 40 or so countries, and of course Australia amongst those where uh, we still have, I think, about 69 people unaccounted for. Um, and it's a, yeah, it's a terribly sad circumstance that the whole world was moving forward so well in an economic sense. We were seeing over the recent years, we have seen over recent years, hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty because of the focus and the cohesion and the cooperation uh, of the majority of the countries of the world because at last the energies of all those countries were being put into improving the economic and social well-being of the nations of the world and not into uh, conflicts over sovereign borders and not into the sorts of conflicts that have, uh, um, we have suffered from over the centuries uh, across the world. Let's hope that that direction has not changed with the events of last week. Let's hope that maturity, professionalism, uh, clarity of thought and vision uh, dominate the thinking across the world uh, over the coming days, weeks and months. It is going to be critically important. I was just watching CNN before I came in here and there's a delegation gone from Pakistan into Afghanistan to seek, um, or to seek from the, uh, the Taliban um, government in Af Afghanistan the, uh, the handing over of uh, one of the suspects uh, of this act of terror. And so we are seeing um, a very, very united front, I suppose, across the world in trying to uh, get some answers and bring some people to justice. But Mr. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I thought it was important today um, in this debate, if I could just record in Hansard, um, some comments that I received last week from our representatives, the Australian government's representatives in New York. And it was by way of an email from Jeff Gray, Austrade's Senior Trade Commissioner and also the Deputy Consul General in New York. Uh, and I quote, I sit here now with my shirt stained with the tears of my shocked staff. Behind me I can see out of my window southern Manhattan, which is covered in smoke and dust as the horrors of the events four hours ago sink in and anger builds in the city. This morning, just before nine, I was at the computer uh, when I turned around and witnessed the first plane hit the left side of the tower. This was a shock for all, and as uh, just four years ago the consulate was temporarily located in the World Trade Center. We were all consoling ourselves as we watched the second plane hit the East Riverside Tower and explode. The anguish and shock was nothing compared to how we felt when an hour later one tower exploded and fell down like a house of cards. Then half an hour later the second tower disintegrated. All of a sudden two of the world's greatest buildings had gone before our eyes. All our staff and family are safe. Several, including myself, cannot return home. We know all the Reserve Bank people are safe, but we have concern for many Australian bankers, brokers and consultants who were in their offices in those buildings this morning. Our staff has departed, most still in shock, walking to friends' places uptown. All, businesses is, all business is closed. There is a strange hush in the streets of this great city, except for the sounds from the emergency vehicles. We are providing assistance to the Consul General, the Ambassador and the, and the disaster team we have established to support the Australian community in Order. New York. I'd just like to uh, um, acknowledge the great work that our uh, Consulate General, Ken Allen, Jeff Gray and our Ambassador Michael Thorley and all their staff have done through this terrible tragedy uh, in the US. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Kingston. Last week the world witnessed something that we had not previously dared to contemplate. At this afternoon's service, in the Great Hall to commemorate the victims, the Bishop of the Australian Defence Force, the Reverend Tom Frame, described those attacks as cruel, ruthless and indiscriminate. They were acts that have no basis in any religion. They were a political act aimed at the heart of America's military and financial institutions. As an attack on America, our strongest ally for more than 50 years, they were an attack on our way of life as well as America's. Last week, the US invoked the ANZUS Treaty, and Australia will stand beside its friend in dealing with this threat to the way of life our two peoples share. Similarly, the US has invoked the NATO alliance. 
Responding to this escalated level of terrorist threat is a collective responsibility of all nations who wish to live free and without fear. The response must be measured and certain to deal with the perpetrators. That action must be calculated to avert any continuation or escalation of this new level of violence, because that, in these circumstances, is indeed a very real risk. This collective, collective action must be concerted and ongoing to deal with the causes of terrorism. The objective must be a world where not only terrorism is unacceptable, but nations cannot promote, harbour or condone terrorism without serious sanction by the international community. We have all been greatly uplifted over the last few days to watch the efforts of the rescue workers in New York to hear the stories of how many of them sacrificed their lives going up into that building before it collapsed. And they probably would have been very well aware of the risks that they were taking when they did that. And we've seen and heard stories about the new spirit of community and unity in New York, which in other days has been a somewhat harder city. And it's time that we reflected on the sort of unity that we want in our own country. We also need to give out our hearts to the people who were, who were killed in these incidents and for the many families who still don't know what has happened uh, to family members and who are waiting in the hope of some good news. Uh, 69 Australians are in that collective group and I'd just like to make mention of one of them who is Andrew Knox, uh, a, a man from young man from Adelaide. He, uh, he's a member of the Labor Party. He was, he's known to me, to me well. He was working on the 103rd floor of the World Trade Centre when the, uh, when the first aircraft hit the tower that he was in. He was on the phone to a colleague and he apparently said that they thought that a plane had hit the tower and, and they were going to the roof. And that is the, that is the last communication with Andrew. Uh, Andrew is the son of Tony and Marion Knox, who, who live at Modbury. Uh, he has a, a twin brother, Stuart, and they are, of course, deeply concerned and waiting for knowledge of what has happened to him. He was a, uh, in, before he went to New York, he was a, a fine industrial advocate working for the AWU in South Australia. He was active in the Labor Party. He, ran the Labor Party's campaign in Macon at the last election and he, he indeed thought about uh, running as a candidate at this election but decided to go and further his career overseas. Um, and our hearts go out to Andrew, to his family uh, and to all his friends who are missing him greatly at this time. The question is the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the Honourable Member for Sturt. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In the book of Ruth, Ruth writes, I will go where you go, I will live where you live, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. The words of Ruth say much more eloquently than I could, Mr Deputy Speaker, how we feel as Australians about our kinship with the people of the United States. We, are, we feel complete solidarity with them in every way. There is no daylight between us and the people of the United States, not a fraction. And to paraphrase Ruth, we will go where they go, we will live where they live, and we will do what they do to ensure freedom in the world. The attack on September the 11th on the United States was a world-changing experience. The world will never be the same again as it was on September the 10th, after September the 11th. And in some ways that will be uh, a tragic thing. In other ways, it may mean a catalyst for a war on terrorism, which has been long overdue uh, amongst the nations of the free world. Because this was an attack on the whole free world, Mr Deputy Speaker, an attack on our values and our way of life 
our commitment to peace and our commitment to democracy. And the Prime Minister was right to identify it as that in the first moments following uh, his knowledge of it on Wednesday. The United States and Australia share the same values as many of the nations of the free world, free institutions, democracy, a commitment to peace. But once roused, those nations of the free world have proven before and will prove on this occasion that they are the most formidable opponents imaginable. The attack on the United States on September the 11th was the greatest attack in the United States' history since the War of 1812, ironically a war fought by the United States against Great Britain, which just goes to show how much has changed and how far back in history uh, an attack of this magnitude was on the soil of the United States. Its importance is magnified when you consider that NATO has invoked Article 5 of its treaty and ANZUS has invoked Article 4 of its treaty the first time in the history of those treaties that those articles have been invoked uh, for the protection of the United States and the rest of the treaty signatories. It's also magnified when you think that the other two great world powers, not as great as the United States, but China and, the, and Russia, are standing with the United States and the rest of the free world in the face of this attack. The change in the geopolitical order of the world will be seismic as a consequence of September the 11th, because all countries are united against terrorism, all countries are united against the indiscriminate attack on civilians. And we have to remember, Mr Deputy Speaker, none of these people signed up for military service. None of the people who died on September the 11th ever thought of themselves as being in the front line of any battle. They are innocent civilians just like you and I, and it could have been any one of us who were in the World Trade Centres, the Pentagon or on those planes that were used so disgracefully, so repugnantly on September the 11th. Australia has pledged to join the United States and the rest of the free world to fight this war against terrorism, and it's not an idle pledge. It's not meaningless. Australian lives have already been lost on September the 11th, and it may well be that other Australian lives are lost as part of the war. The words of Tennyson in Ulysses uh, come to mind at this time. We are a part of all that we have met. Though much is taken, much abides. That which we are, we are, one equal portion of heroic hearts, made weak by time, but strong to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Watson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As a member for Watson, I represent a diverse group of Australians, many nationalities, many religions, many cultures. And I'm grateful for this opportunity this evening to extend my condolence on behalf of my constituents to the people of America in the wake of this act of barbarism. Like many members of this House, Mr Deputy Speaker, I never miss an episode of West Wing, that encapsulation of American politics. So, so it was last Tuesday night. And it was with a sense of unreality that I then watched on the news that immediately followed West Wing the events which were unfolding in New York and Washington. Like many Australians, I was up until the early hours of Wednesday morning watching the news, wondering, can this possibly get worse, when all the time it did. There is no doubt that these were acts of barbarism and our hearts go out to all those who have been touched by this disaster. It was particularly poignant to hear the stories of those who had worked in the buildings, ordinary people going about their daily work life. The people who were in these buildings were not involved in any acts of aggression or war against anybody. And it was not just American citizens who were killed or injured in these events. I am particularly mindful of the nearly 70 Australians who are still missing a reminder to all of us that we now live in a truly international society. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, as in all disasters, our spirits were lifted by the selfless sacrifice of many. Every day in the newspapers and on the television last week, we saw new heroes, people who lost their lives to support others, the passengers on the plane that crashed outside Philadelphia, the brave firemen and police in New York and Washington, and that terrible photograph in one of the newspapers of the firemen going up the stairs in the World Trade Centre while everyone else ran out to his own certain death, epitomised to me 
the courage of the emergency service workers, and our hearts go out to their families. Mr Deputy Speaker, no decent person of any faith would perpetrate a barbarous act like this against innocent people. And in supporting this motion, I'd particularly like to draw the House's attention to paragraph 8. This is particularly important because at this time of great emotional turmoil, we shouldn't be looking for enemies within. We should bear in mind what the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition have said about making scapegoats of Australians of the Muslim faith. In this time of crisis, we must reach out to them as well because they're suffering because of the actions of a few bigots. <clears throat> Last Wednesday, with the state member for Lakemba, I visited the Lakemba Mosque in my electorate, where they were holding a prayer vigil for the victims and their families. I want to assure those people tonight that it is as absurd to attribute blame to Australian Muslims as it would be to attribute blame to Australian Catholics for the actions of the IRA. No decent Australian attributes any blame to the Australian Muslim community for this terrible disaster in the US. Mr Deputy Speaker, I've been pleased to hear the words of Vice President Cheney and Secretary, State of, Secretary of State Powell saying that America's response to this tragedy will be measured and accurate. The international community should join together to strike down international terrorism because it is a threat to the freedom of us all. But in doing so, we should not give in to the hysteria or calls for revenge. This resolution is not a carte blanche for international war against in innocent people. Otherwise, we become no better than the terrorists themselves. This is a time for cool heads and considered actions. We should join with the Americans in bringing the perpetrators of this crime to justice, but we should ensure that we are not laying the ground for another group of disaffected fanatics to grow out of the ashes of our actions. Mr Deputy Speaker, I join with all members of the House in extending my condolences to the families and friends of all those who died or were injured in these terrible atrocities in the United States last Tuesday. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the Honourable Member for Wannan. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I join with colleagues uh, in this condolence motion, and I must say that listening uh, to the opposition whip, I couldn't help but agree with some of his sent sent sentiments about the importance of cool heads and taking a considered view on how we might handle this. But I would like to very much support the words of the Prime Minister uh, and the eight points that uh, he has made and acknowledge that uh, the very strong support that is uh, given by all members in this House uh, to this motion, which of course uh, was seconded by the Leader of the Opposition. And I think that it shows the very strong, dare I say, unanimous support uh, to the United States in this very difficult time and in particular to the families of those bereaved, those who uh, still would be questioning why this ever occurred and uh, you know, why was it uh, ever considered that, uh, such innocent, that innocent people would be struck down in this bizarre way. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, when we look at this whole question, the points that are made in the Prime Minister's uh, motion uh, where he talks about expressing the horror, I think is widespread and uh, probably has almost unanimous support, not only in this House but right throughout the nation. Um, I think it's very important that we reinforce the very strong support that we do have uh, for the people of the United States and their government in this difficult, difficult time and extend our deepest sympathy. And uh, we certainly do share the loss that uh, they have felt, not only um, through the people, but of course the ongoing effect. And as previous speakers have pointed out, it is a point in time where things have changed, where things will not go back to where they were. And not only uh, does it uh, represent an assault on the people and the values of the United States, but on free societies everywhere. And I think, again, um, that is a very significant point and one that uh, we are going to have to unite together in the free world and with people right across the world to work out how we are going to tackle this uh, very, very difficult uh, attack that's been mounted uh, on the freedoms that uh, we so much value. I think it's also uh, important that when we consider what happens from here on in, and I know today is not the day to uh, discuss that in any de detail, that we do 
display those very qualities of tolerance, as the Prime Minister put it, and the inclusion uh, which, uh, the, you know, that uh, we value so much, which of course the terrorists have assaulted. And it is very important uh, in, when we deal with this issue that we don't uh, stoop to the terrorist level and see uh, loss of innocent lives of people uh, wherever it might be in the world that uh, those who need to be brought to justice are going to have to be brought to justice. But having said that, it is very, very important uh, that we do see these people brought to justice, and therefore I strongly support the Prime Minister's uh, work in invoking uh, section, Article 4 of the ANZUS Treaty uh, to ensure that Australia has demonstrates very clearly that uh, we are wholeheartedly with the United States in their efforts to uh, seek to out those who have perpetrated this crime against innocent people uh, to ensure that not only uh, can they be brought to justice, but also the message is made very clearly right throughout the world uh, that this is not going to be tolerated. And uh, I think that is very important. It is, I think, uh, interesting to note how this has developed in a way that uh, probably we haven't uh, seen before. Uh, the military people have a interesting expression for it. They call it asymmetric warfare. That is, when one side is incapable of direct warfare, uh, they will use such a thing like this unexpected attack on the World Trade Center to wage what is, has been described as war. And I think uh, that really is what it is. It's an unprovoked attack on innocent civilians and therefore is something that is going to have to be dealt with accordingly. But uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, on today I think it is very much a day for us, and I certainly express on behalf of my electorate of Wannan uh, our heartfelt sympathy uh, to those uh, who have lost their lives and to the families of those who have lost their lives uh, in this tragic and dreadful situation. The question is that the motion moved by the um, Prime Minister be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Holt. Deputy Speaker. Um, it is with some sense of sadness that I rise tonight to support this resolution, this condolence motion. I think there will be very few times in our political lives where we will discuss an issue that has affected our nation and our community as much as this one. I would particularly like to start with extending my condolences to the people of America and to the families of those that have lost ones and loved ones, and importantly to the Australian families of the 69 missing Australians. Um, what must be going through their minds at this period of time is something, obviously, that is we would not want to share. But the only thing we can do is lend our support as fellow Australians and our respect and our love, because um, having lost loved ones, um, we know how it feels. And for them to be put in a situation like this, with their families being very far away, must be a terrible set of circumstances. Um, we, as, as Australians, have reacted not just as Australians but as human beings with a great sense of horror, outrage, disbelief. Events like this, I think, ratify to us or clarify to us the fragility of human existence. Whom of us, when we were watching our television sets, watching the news at 11 p.m., as I was on that Tuesday evening, would have possibly envisaged that a plane would smash with the intent, with the intent of wanton destruction of human life into a symbol of democracy and of freedom and of power. What it quite clearly illustrates to our community, to the community at large, visually, dramatically, inescapably, is no building, however tall, or no country, however strong, is immune from acts of wanton human destruction, of evil. As I said, and, our, and this has been brought back to us in the most dramatic and visual way possible. There's no doubt that freedom-loving nations must react and must react strongly to this atrocity, this barbaric act that was committed. But can I urge that we must react in a measured way, a calculating way, a deliberative way? We have been obviously given an inescapable reminder that these sorts of terrible acts can be committed. But we must react in a sense of calm deliberation, not in a sense of wanting revenge not in a sense of trying to perpetrate wanton destruction. I took great heart and strength from the purposeness, pur purposeness of the American people and how they resolve, their coolness, their sense of unity, 
their sense of trying to move forward. And thus, when we find or think of ways in which we must react, we must use that same sense of purpose, that same deliberate calm, that same manner of response. And thus, if we react in that way, we'll react in a way in which we should be, rather than seeking wanton revenge on an unclear enemy at this point in time. It's amazing how this event has affected people in my electorate. What seems to have been missed in this condolence motion to some extent is the strength of character of the Australian people. I mean, whom amongst us, when we moved through our electorates, would not have been impressed by people coming together, talking about their experiences? In Melbourne, for example, a radio station threw open its lines so people could just talk about their experiences. And Australian people have reacted in a sense of sympathy in a sense of profound sorrow, in a sense of profound grief, and they've been in a sense of sharing. They are sharing their experiences with fellow Australians. We've had some other sort of less um, palatable manifestations of what has happened, particularly within my community, where we have a large Muslim community, and people have been felt as though they've been unfairly scapegoated. But that's a very, very small proportion. What I have found are people talking with sincere regret, with horror about what has happened, trying to rationalise what has actually happened, trying to make sense of it. And that certainly is a hallmark of the Australian character, and trying to provide support. I live next to an American family who knew someone that was on a plane. It's in, we are citizens of a global community, and this event, more than anything, ratifies that. If there's something that I can just turn on, there were church services held throughout my electorate, and there was one particular story that was mentioned specifically, and a parish priest asked me to raise it. And the story goes, some time ago, a man punished his five-year-old daughter for wasting a roll of expensive gold wrapping paper. Money was tight and became even more upset when the child pasted the gold paper so as to decorate a box to put under the Christmas tree. Nevertheless, the little girl brought the gift box to her father the next morning and said, this is for you, Daddy. The father was embarrassed by his earlier overreaction, but his anger flared again when he found that the box was empty. He spoke to her in a harsh manner. Don't you know, young lady, when you give someone a present, there's supposed to be something inside the package. The little girl looked out at him with tears in her eyes and said, Daddy, it's not empty. I blew kisses into it until it was full. The father was crushed. He fell onto his knees and put his arm around his little girl, and he begged her to forgive him for his unnecessary anger. An accident took the life of the child only a short time later, and it was told the father kept the gold box by his bed for all the years of his life. And whenever he was discouraged or faced difficult problems, he would open the box and take out an imaginary kiss and remember the love of the child who had put it there. In a very real sense, each of us as human beings has been given Order. a golden box filled with unconditional love and kisses Order. from our children, family and friends the and God. Is this what you must remember in these sorts of circumstances? Expired. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Dawson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the Prime Minister's motion today. This week, evil has taken flight and crashed into the heart of the greatest democracy on earth. People from many countries and faiths died at the World Trade Center in New York, at the Pentagon in Washington and the air crash site in Pennsylvania. They were people like you and I, waving to spouses, kissing children off to school, preparing for a busy day, unaware that it was their last morning on earth. The toll is truly terrible. One firm alone has lost, they estimate, 700 people. That is 1,400 children who have lost a parent. These people were attacked because they live in and support a free, open and democratic society. The attack on America and her values and beliefs is an attack on we Australians as well, for we share the same values and beliefs. For our dear friends in America, may God's loving kindness be a comfort and support to them in the terrible days and months ahead. The evil perpetrators of these terrible acts must be brought to account. There must be a calm, purposeful and effective response to these terrorists and those who laud terrorism. The Prime Minister has rightly said that terrorism has no faith and no nationality. This is true. I want to share with the House particularly and mentioned to the House our own Muslim community in Mackay, some of whom attended the interdenominational service on Friday afternoon. Imam Barry Hassan, 
particularly told me how distressed the Mackay Muslim community was by the tragic events and condemn those responsible. I also fully support the Prime Minister's pledge of Australia's support, within our capabilities, of the United States-led action against those responsible for these terrible acts. Mr Deputy Speaker, we must not allow time, rhetoric, cost or academic argument to cause us to waver in supporting our American friends. Those who died and their families who remain must have justice, and those of us who live must live not in fearful shadows, but live in the sunshine of freedom and democracy. Thank you. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the honourable member for prospect. I thank, <coughs> I thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And as speakers who have preceded me, I too join the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition in this condolence motion before the House today. In the United States, on the 11th of September 2001, what can only be described as a truly horrible attack on freedom changed our world. Many Australians watched in the complete state of disbelief as those twin towers of the World Trade Center, which was once symbols of success, democracy and capitalism in the free world, came crushing to the ground, and the defense headquarters of the world's only superpower lay crippled by the senseless acts of a few madmen. To the people of America, Mr Deputy Speaker, the whole Australian community mourns with you. Words expressing our deepest condolences and sympathy at a time like this seem so futile. To the people who have lost their loved ones in this senseless human tragedy, we do pray for them. To those who gave their lives to help save others, may you never be forgotten. We as a society must continue to denounce this cowardly act, the magnitude and consequences of which, of which are just far too great to comprehend at this moment. However, Mr Deputy Speaker, violence must not beget violence. People are looking for a reason. Feelings of shock are now being replaced by revenge, by anger, by retribution for this act of bastardry. To those people who call for, for revenge, their rage and anger is shared by all people of good faith, regardless of their religion. We must turn these feelings into action, which shows civility and intelligence by reacting in a way which will punish the guilty and protect the innocent. We must not start to engage in stupid actions which will only create division and hatred within our multicultural communities. A network of international extremist terrorists were obviously responsible for this act of pure evil, and it is these underground terrorist organisations which must be brought to justice. People, Mr Deputy Speaker, will always remember what they were doing at that moment when it took place. In my case, I was here in Canberra at the CPA conference, and just before midnight my daughter rang and said, Mum, quick, turn on the TV. I st sat there glued to that TV for six hours. Of course, the first action was to ring my son, who travels widely. Two weeks before that, he was in that very same spot in America. He was fine. He said, I'm in Hong Kong. I rang my sister to find out about my nieces, my nephew and the family, and of course, they live in Philadelphia. But then, Mr Deputy Speaker, my daughter sent me Rory Robinson's report, which is a first-hand episode of what happened. Here is a man who was lucky, an Australian who escaped. And I'd like to put on the record of this parliament, this is not what the reporters are reporting. This is an individual, an Australian like you and I. Like many others, I was way too close to the action. I'm pretty shaken, though. I don't have a scratch. Thank you for all of those who called to see that I'm OK. At about 8.45 a.m., we were on the ground floor in the World Trade Center, Marriott, listening to the breakfast speaker of the National Association for Business Economics Conference when what turned out to be the first hijacked plane hit our tower. There was a bit of a bang and the building shook. We all looked at each other across the table, wondering, is it an earthquake? Presumably, everyone else was also thinking about the 110 floors above us. Then the building shook again. Everyone ran for the door and then the foyer. The move was reasonably ordered, orderly, but I noticed dust and smoke coming from one lip well, and I'm thinking it's probably a bomb like in 1993. I was terrified, but I was okay. Everyone was keen to get out of the street, but we didn't really know how frightened we were. On getting to the foyer, you could see the debris outside on the ground. Hotel officials told the people not to go outside, as things might still be crushing down. Maybe five minutes later, but then people moved. They moved outside and we could see the hole near the top of the building and the fire. It was mind-numbing. Thousands of people were spilling out into the street from buildings in the financial district, but none of us had much idea what had happened. Someone said it was a missile. Another said a helicopter had crashed into the tower, so it might have been an accident. I didn't have a clue what to do. I guess the conference was over. Growing crowds were milling around like everybody else. I just kept looking up, marvelling at the hole and the fire near the top of the first tower. I didn't see people jumping out, but many were just talking about it. 
I noticed a car torn in half and the engine that seemed to have flown out of nowhere. I tried to ring Gwen and Matt. Friends, they knew I was in the WTC today to let them know I was okay. The mobile wouldn't work, but eventually Gwen got through and she let Matt know it worked for me. I tried to ring my brother in Brisbane, but the mobile wouldn't call out. I figured I'd walk downtown from the WTC and then walk to Midtown via the east side. As I started to move away, I observed Deborah's here and all sorts of things you would expect to see when a passenger plane explodes. I was 250 yards from the World Trade Center when I looked up and saw the second plane fly directly, maybe 150 yards just above me. Instantly, I knew it was going to hit the tower. I didn't watch. I didn't see it hit. I just ran, maybe 50 yards toward an alley behind a building, terrified that the Deborah's would easily carry to where I stood. As I ran, I heard the explosion as the second plane hit. I made the alley. I hugged the near side of the building. My thought was that the building was not high enough to block out any flying objects, and looking around the alley, I saw bits and pieces from the first plane. A young Japanese woman stumbled into the alley. She was crying, very distressed. We just hugged at one another against the wall. I put my arms around her shoulder and told her that we were safe, at the same time hoping we were. It was like being in the middle of a disaster movie. It was hard to credit what was unfolding all around. After waiting a few minutes, I started walking quickly to the bottom of the island before heading east and then uptown. Looking over my left shoulder, I saw the Order. holes of the two towers, and it goes on. This man experienced it. He is an Australian. He says, I shudder to think how many hundreds today have died. This is indeed a human tragedy. It is, Mr Deputy Speaker, a human tragedy, but I plead to those yeah. people who want action, and we all do it, that we will be judged in history by what actions and deeds we take today. Let us again mourn for those people who have lost their lives and let us praise those who have done the work in trying to save them. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Menzies. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Like tens of thousands of other Australians, I switched on the television last Tuesday evening to catch the late news and spent the next few hours transfixed as the destruction and devastation of the World Trade Centre and the Pentagon took place. The image of the second aircraft exploding into the Trade Centre and the subsequent implosion of the two buildings, killing thousands in the process, will remain imprinted in my mind forever. Words cannot describe fully our reaction to this terrible tragedy, nor convey our feelings of horror at this manifestation of evil. Terrorism is not confined to those who purport to clothe themselves in the garments of Islam. We only have to recall some of the other trouble spots in the world to know that evil is not born of a particular race or religion, but in the minds of fanatical individuals. The shock and devastation of this tragedy is shared by all men and women of goodwill, men and women of all faiths and of none. If we allow fear to fester and individuals or particular communities to become scapegoats, the terrorists and their supporters will have achieved in part their objectives. We should not and cannot allow that to happen. Darkness cannot be lifted by darkness, nor terrorism defeated by terrorism. It can only be overcome by a firm commitment to those values which undergird our civilization. Justice tempered with compassion, rights balanced by responsibilities, and our response to aggression not only resolute, but targeted and proportionate. Forty years ago, John Fitzgerald Kennedy reminded us that, in the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. Unexpectedly and without adequate warning, that role has been conferred on the peace-loving peoples of the world. We cannot fail this task. The alternative is too horrifying to contemplate. There can be no freedom without personal safety and national security. Let our memorial to the thousands of innocent victims of these murderous deeds be a more peaceful world in which virtue abounds and fanaticism is driven from the face of the globe. Mr Deputy Speaker, I join with my colleagues in this place in condemning these attacks offering prayer for the victims, expressing condolences to the families and friends of those killed and injured, praising the bravery of the emergency workers, supporting the United States in their response to this terror, and recommitting to the pursuit of peace, welfare and dignity for all the people of the world. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the honourable member for the Northern Territory. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. 
on my behalf and the, that of my family, and I'm sure on the behalf of every person living in the Northern Territory, in my electorate, I would like to extend our sympathies, our deepest sympathies to the families and friends of those who have been killed and injured and those who are missing, and ask God to assist those who are undertaking that heroic emergency work, <coughs> both previously and now. I know that I speak on behalf of all Territorians when I express anger, horror and sadness at this absurd, vicious and premeditated act of terrorism and mass murder against defenceless citizens. This is a tragedy for the world community uh, that will reverberate through time. It's particularly important for us in the Northern Territory because we host a relatively large number of citizens of the United States in Alice Springs, most of whom work at the Pine Gap Joint Defence Facility. And I know I can say with certainty that the community of Alice Springs has expressed its concern its concern and its support for those United States citizens in Alice Springs and their families away. We also, of course, express our deep felt and heartfelt condolences to those Australian families who've got, who we know have uh, um, family members who are missing and we know of three who are, we know to be dead. Those involved in this tragedy were innocent vic victims. They didn't deserve to die. They weren't part of anyone's war. This murder of these innocent people can never be accepted, never be condoned and never be supported. Those who committed this terrible act must be brought to justice. There must be a war on terrorism. But it must be even-tempered. The innocent must be protected around the world. and That is why when we seek the criminals who did this terrible act, we must not fall into the trap of, make, of, of terrible acts of our own. When we embark on this quest for justice, we must not allow innocent people to become victims in that quest. The, innocents, the innocent everywhere must be protected, regardless of where they live. We cannot afford to escalate the danger to innocence in our quest for justice, because if we do so, we begin to lose the battle. The only way to win this war is by protecting the innocent to ensure a permanent end to the war against terror, to end this war against terror. When Islamic Australians, when Australians of Middle Eastern heritage are threatened or assaulted, when their property or places of worship are attacked, we are heading for defeat down entirely the wrong path. We damage ourselves and our unity as a nation. We must ensure that we are not guilty of typecasting, of vilifying, of victimising innocent people because of who they are, because of their religion or where they've come from. Our success or failure in this war depends on our capacity to defend the innocent and ensure a lasting peace. We have an obligation to ensure that in committing ourselves to this cause, we will do so with humility and humanity. We must be involved in this struggle for justice and we must recognise and accept that our diversity is itself a mark of our strength as a democracy. And we must ensure that our quest for justice is not prompted by vengeance but a desire to bring, back the, bring those who are responsible for this outrageous act of terror to justice. And in the cold light of day, the world community has an obligation to those whose lives have been lost and those who feel the pain of loss and are grieving, and to all in present and future generations to strive to fight against terrorism and violence wherever it, wherever it exists and for whatever reason. The fight against terrorism is a fight that we must win. It must be a fought with common sense and it must be fought with humanity. Our friends in the United States have suffered. We say to them, we will stand by you in this quest for justice in this your hour of trial. We stand by you with an emerging international and strong, and strong coalition of nations. We share your grief and all those who have lost friends and family, you are in our prayers. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Hughes. I rise in support of the Prime Minister's motion of condolence on behalf of our American friends and in their hour of national distress. 
the act of terrorism against a peaceful democratic nation, one of the family of democratic nations to which Australia belongs, is an act of terror against Australia and every human being who believes in freedom, democracy, decency and justice. We say to our American friends, your loss is our loss, your grief is our grief. The many thousands of souls who lost their lives last Tuesday in the four aircraft in the World Trade Towers in the Pentagon came from many nations, but they were all our kindred. They shared our values, our ideals, our hopes and our aspirations for the future. We say to our American friends, we will stand beside you in your time of trouble as you have stood beside us in the past. With other nations of like spirit, we will face the future together, equally committed to liberty, freedom, truth and human decency for all peoples of the earth. But in addition to the loss of so many thousands of our fellow human beings, and in the face of the hateful, deliberate destruction of the symbols of the economic and industrial supremacy of the Western world, we also witnessed the ravaging of the fragile, vital trust from which our shared democratic institutions derive their authority and consensus. The democratic freedoms and the decency which we in the Western world treasure but take so much for granted are all based upon trust. They stem from a mutual respect for the shared values which underpin the social and commercial intercourse of our global fraternity. After September the 11th, the democratic freedoms and the common decency which characterised our world can no longer be taken for granted. From now on, we are chillingly aware that we must be vigilant. We have again learnt the terrible lessons of our forefathers that they had learnt and that we must be forever vigilant against tyranny, now a tyranny manifested in a warfare of mass terrorism. Last Tuesday, the world stood still. In Australia, we are very much aware that our world will never be quite the same again. We are aware that our civilization has reached a fork in the road. While we wait at the junction with the untrod pathways ahead, it is useful to remember from whence we have come because our past often holds sound lessons for how we can navigate the future. We look to our national flag. It boldly proclaims three crosses of ancient Christendom, the historic crosses of St George, St Andrew and St Patrick that were revered by our earliest forefathers. And it blazes with our own cross from the celestial firmament above our island home, the Great Southern Cross, the symbol of the Great Southland of the Holy Spirit. Our national flag has flown high and free over several generations of Australians. It was saluted by my grandfather and his mates when they marched into the mud and death in Ypres in 1917. It was saluted by my father and his mates in the Middle East in World War II, and it was saluted by our soldiers in Kapiong and Marion Sang in Korea, and later in Long Tan and Nui Dat in South Vietnam. Our national flag has been the standard of our brave for just over 100 years, and may it remain so for a thousand more. Every Australian knows our flag stands for democracy, decency and freedom and justice. And in the aftermath of the terror of last week, we must never forget that each of these very important values has served our nation so very well for so long that they have become part of our national psyche. Our flag, the flag of the legendary Anzacs, reminds us that in the face of adversity, Australians never give up, Australians believe in a fair go, Australians always look after their mates, and especially Australians know the distinction between vengeance and justice. All Australians reject and deplore any notion of guilt by association that has reportedly been alleged against our fellow Australians of the Muslim faith. In the face of an uncertain world, my prayer at this hour is that our Heavenly Father will make Australia a blessing to all nations, that he will grant to our Prime Minister and to the Leader of the Opposition and to the Parliament the wisdom, the courage and the determination to lead us in justice and righteousness. And as our forefathers before us, with the Southern Cross to steer by, they will lead us fearlessly and in the honourable defence of the values of democracy, freedom and utter decency that all Australians hold as dearly as our American friends. God bless America. God bless Australia. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the Honourable Member for Lyons. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. How can one uh, express the feeling of condolence uh, on such uh, an immense uh, uh, tragedy? Uh, I watched uh, the buildings fall, those uh, World Trade buildings fall, and uh, I thought that uh, I had been there in those buildings. I had lunch with some American friends some years ago, and there was probably hundreds of people uh, there as well doing what I did innocently, without any thoughts of fear or disaster. And as I watched uh, this growing uh, aura uh, unfold, I saw uh, so many people, innocent people, non-combatants in, in war terms, ordinary people like us. We know the uh, 
we know the bravery uh, of the emergency service personnel who rushed towards the scene rather than away when they needed uh, to be there and, of course, where so many perished. Um, <clears throat> they must be the biggest heroes, the firemen and the police. Um, there are those who managed, of course, to divert that fourth plane from some other target. They are also heroes. Such bravery, of course, is always seen by those who are involved as I only did what others would do or I was only doing my job. Yet we rely on those people uh, so much in our day-to-day -day lives, certainly even here in Australia. When there are bushfires and floods and disasters, we know that we have some of those uh, best people on hand as well. Likewise, uh, in the United States, they too have those men and women who, although merely doing their job, put their lives at risk without question. I know only too well when the Port Arthur tragedy occurred, our police, our emergency services, our ambulance and fire personnel, our doctors and nurses bore the blunt of that tragedy. So too have their US counterparts put themselves in danger and of course some have paid the ultimate price for their professionalism. We are fortunate to have uh, such people. We are fortunate that all around the world and it doesn't matter from which country, which belief, which idealism, there are still people who will risk their lives for others. And of course I put here aid workers, peacekeepers too. They too uh, forget the dangers and the discomforts and go forward to help their fellow human beings in whatever form that takes. We don't yet uh, have the full account of this tragedy, but we know that at least 40 nations have been affected with losing people and maybe more. So why should something like this happen? Why should hate be so strong to wish thousands to die as they have done here in New York and Washington and Pennsylvania? It is because despite the selfishness of so many people in many parts of the global communities, there are some who move in hate and in envy. Those who are under the control of one or more or people of fanatics who do not understand the greater tolerance, the human rights that all religions adhere to, they're into power and control is everything really for these fanatics. We can have the hate here too uh, if we're not careful and it doesn't come from without, it comes from within and each and every one of us, if we allow the base of sentiments to emerge, can take us over. I hear it on my phone lines about refugees, I hear it about racial intolerance in countries both here and overseas, and I hear it with neighbours one against the other. So I think before we move to criticise any persons or countries for leaving a country under siege to these powermongers, and terrorists, we must look in our own hearts and say, what would I do in their position? Yes, we must find whoever has committed these crimes. We must seek them out by all the means that we have, but we must bring them to justice and we must then seek revenge. Hate breeds revenge and we must do everything to stop that hate breeding among the countries that have a concern in this tragedy. We should support uh, the United States of America in their move to bring these culprits to justice. So, here in Australia, all the Australian families, all the American families who have lost loved ones or are still on missing lists, I send my heartfelt condolences from both myself, my family, my staff and the people of Tasmania. Well I uh, support the motion. The the question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. On the 16th of September last year, I was at the swimming at the Sydney Olympics. Along with 17,500 others, we watched the men's 4 by 100 metres freestyle, and Australia defeated the United States of America for the first time ever in this event. We were friends but great rivals. 
I, along with so many others, was elated and sang the national anthem with joy, celebration and pride. Today, with my parliamentary colleagues, I sang the Australian and, national, and American national anthems as hymns, and we did so for good reason. Today, in a special memorial service, we were remembering the victims of the 11th of September. Our hearts were light this time last year, and today they are heavy. I want to associate myself with what the Prime Minister has already had to say. Like so many others, I saw the horror unfold as it happened on CNN. I was at home with my son on Tuesday night when I received a phone call from a friend to suggest that I put the television on because a tower of the World Trade Centre had been hit by a plane. To watch television in my own home and see a second plane hit the World Trade Centre is something that will live with me forever. Then to hear that the Pentagon had been hit and that there was another plane that was unaccounted for. To learn that the fourth plane had crashed in Pennsylvania, no doubt because of the brave actions of some passengers who decided that it was better to die then to have the, than to have their plane used as another weapon of horrible destruction. I know it's been said so many times before, but it was like watching a horror movie. We now know that there are over 5,000 missing, presumed dead, from 40 different nations. It was an attack on all of us in the free world. The United uh, States stood by us in World War II, and while we are peaceful people, we must now stand with the people of America. As Brad Kraut said in yesterday's Sunday Mail, it's time to stand up for shared values and for the United States and the United Kingdom because they are the torchbearers of values we hold most dear, freedom, democracy, human rights, justice. It's also time to stand by a friend in pain. I visited Kuwait in 1994 with other colleagues and saw destruction there. I also met with families of the missing persons and they had photos and when they cried, I confess that I cried. I've also visited Cyprus and seen uh, women holding up still after 20 of more than 25 or six years, photos of their missing loved ones at uh, barbed wire fences and the United Nations checkpoints. We then saw in our own television sets in more recent days, American people holding up photos of their families and how they were grieving. And I think that that had a, a powerful uh, effect on us. I must also say in thinking about Kuwait that those are that the Prime Minister and others who have warned that we must not typecast Muslim people, or I would say people from the Middle East, is uh, Kuwait is the classic example. They are our friends, and I, of course there are others, but uh, it doesn't require too much imagination to remember how grateful they have been for our assistance uh, uh, in the Gulf War. The people that we saw on our television sets holding up photos of their family are just like us, and it's too terrible to think of their suffering and of the, of the more than 5,000 grieving families, not to mention their countless friends and acquaintances who are also suffering. Witnessing such heartbreak, pain and sorrow makes us want to stay close to our families. The destruction caused by the terrorists cast them as murderers, not martyrs. This is about evil versus good. It cannot possibly be about a religion or other more altruistic goals because such things do not condone murder or violence, let alone attacks on innocent and helpless civilians. But there have been inspiring stories, stories of great survival and heroism, and today we pay tribute to those who in frightful circumstances have helped others. There is grief within my own electorate, wherever I have been over the last few days, including street corner meetings and community functions. People have wanted to tell me how they have felt, the anguish they have felt, their insecurity, and that the world is suddenly a more dangerous place, and, that their, and their sympathy for the American people. On behalf of the people of my electorate of Adelaide, may I convey to the people of the United States of America our sympathy, our understanding and our solidarity. We express our sympathy also to the families of Australians who are known to be dead or who are still unaccounted for. What are the questions? The motion moved by the Prime Minister to be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Lilly. 
Like December 7, 1941, September 11, 2001 is yet another date that will live on in infamy. When President Roosevelt declared war on Japan all those years ago, the world could never have envisaged that 60 years on the world would again face terror from the skies. It is a grossly different world today. The stakes are higher, the weapons are more terrible, the, the fanaticism more ruthless, but the peace just as fragile. Needless to say, we are all shocked to the core by the events of the last week and are keeping in our thoughts those that may still be alive and the friends and families of all those souls that have not made it. In this difficult time for the US, every Australian spent the last week sharing the terrible sadness felt by the American people. Like America, we value our peace, we value our standard of living and we value our security. But the last week has taught us how fragile these treasures really are. In the place that made famous the motto, greed is good, we all must now acknowledge that in, in the events of the last week following the tragedy, we have seen through the efforts of the firefighters, the volunteers and all of those people that have flocked to assist those in need, the bonds of love and peace that hold our families and our communities together. We have seen, I guess, good old-fashioned mateship. It is the foundation upon which Australia's culture is, is built. In the official history of Australia in World War I, the great C.E.W. C. E. Bean observed that Australia's prevailing creed was a, a, a romantic one, of which the chief article was that a man should at all times and at any cost stand by his mate. It was, he said, the one law which the good, the good Australian must never break. It was there at times of war. It was also during, there during our own disasters and tragedy. It is, it is harnessed and most often displayed in our emergency services, our armed forces, our volunteer firefighters, our public hospitals and our ambulance services. services. We saw it too amongst the American emergency workers. Many a survivor of the World Trade Buildings commented as they fled the building those incredible emer emergency workers were literally running in the opposite direction. Sadly, a great many, many of them did not come out. Crises, crises like that of September 11 teach us how much we, we rely on the bravery and commitment of these people, how valuable to us they and their selflessness is. It is testament to our public services and a timely reminder that we must value them and resource them in good times as well as bad. There is a terrible human toll of the last week. It will dwarf some of our peacetime disasters. 5,000 people are still missing and 70 of whom are Australians unaccounted for. So in the events of the last week, we, we must confront our feelings of bitterness and the desire for revenge. But we, we also have to know our enemy and acknowledge too that the world over there are peoples filled with the same bitterness, hatred and desire for revenge for all sorts of reasons. This is now the context in which we live. Robert Kennedy said on the death of Martin Luther, Luther King, let us dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and to make gentle the life of this world. Citizens around the world are now rightly asking questions about their own nation, about their world and about the direction in which the world should now move. As we look to the future, I sincerely hope that the terrible events of the last week don't trigger a vicious cycle of hate and war. History will judge those who killed, but history will also judge us by how we respond. Difficult times lie ahead. Difficult decisions must be made. We must strike at the heart of terrorism, but we must be careful not to exact a toll of yet more innocent lives. Above all, I hope and trust that, the good, that good will come of it and we can make our world a safer place to live. And over and above that, I think we must talk to our young people about the events of the past week or so, because I think they have been tremendously affected. What do our young people think by those images? I'd like to read a poem written by a 17-year-old uh, young Australian, my daughter Erin, summing up her feelings, and it says, I sit watching the buzzing TV. The cameras swarm like bees over the wildflower dying right before my eyes. Tears spilling down like the perspiration in my head, scared for them and for us. How can I imagine what it must have been like on that plane, in those buildings? People fall like rain, petals crashing down around, the ghosts climbing the skies, drifting up and looking down. I wonder what the view is like in humanity's darkest hour. So many tears, and they sweat from the heat of the blaze. That is anger. What's the point of revenge? And they wonder, as I do, how we can call ourselves humanity when the flower is dead. We can only move forward by talk, talking to our young people, and we can only talk to them about a better future. That's the good that must come from this. The honourable member for Moncrief. Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased to be able to have this opportunity to totally support this motion of condolence on behalf of my constituents. 
I also have a feeling of deep personal identification with what it conveys. I was born in Brisbane in the darkest days of World War II, two months before the Battle of the Coral Sea, and I grew up hearing about the Brisbane Line and how the United States entry into the Pacific War had saved me and my family from an unthinkable fate. My American-born husband enlisted for that Pacific War immediately after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Ever since we turned on CNN at 11 p.m. last Tuesday, 9 a.m. New York time, idly curious before we went to bed as to what the morning news was in the United States and witnessed the live broadcast of those cataclysmic attacks on New York and Washington, we have been grieving together at what they mean for both America and Australia. No one in the world, whether now or in future generations, will escape the aftershocks of those terrorist attacks on the United States of America on Tuesday, 11 September, in the first year of the third Christian millennium. We all rightly have deep fears for the future of the world as we know it. Civilised people stand dumbfounded and uncomprehending of the nature of a mind that could firstly conceive and then carefully plan and execute over a period of years such an unspeakably barbaric act. Notwithstanding its incomprehensibility, we nevertheless know instinctively that it is an act of war. We may have been able to fondly hope over the past decade since the end of the Cold War that we may never again see a world war. Now we are racked by uncertainty as to whether we would ever dare hope that again. Nevertheless, with all the fierce and possible consequences of that massacre of innocence on such a catastrophic scale, the overwhelming reaction I have sensed from the Australian public has been one of the most profound revulsion, as well as sorrow and personal sympathy for America and its people. Almost everyone recognises it for what it is, an attempt to destroy American spirit and what they stand for as a freedom-loving nation. The outpouring of expressions of condolence and the offers of staunch support from so many of the peoples and governments of the world have given Americans a measure of reassurance that they are not alone. It is particularly appropriate, then, that Australia express that support here today through this condolence motion in its principal national democratic institution, the Australian Parliament. It is a symbolic affirmation of the mutuality of both our nation's most deeply cherished standards of respect for freedom, the very standards which are now being directly attacked by terrorism. There has been a constant reference over the past week to America's just right of retaliation under these particular circumstances. Frankly, I do not see an American military response as retaliation. I see it as an act of self-defence. None of us believe that last week's events represent the entirety of the enemy's attack plan, albeit that that enemy is as yet nameless and will most likely prove not to be a conventional military operation of a particular national government or governments. For America to not defend itself in a way meant to eliminate future attacks that would surely kill many more ordinary Americans would be to fail the most basic obligation of any national government to, to defend the lives of its citizens. The New York emergency workers have become a worldwide symbol of courage, tenacity and decency in the face of veritably mountainous, stark evidence of unimaginable horror and personal tragedy. Their task last Tuesday and the days ever since exemplify the daunting challenge we now face we all now face. Their response to their particular challenge sets an example for the world. I also want to pay tribute to how President Bush has handled every stage of these events since he was first made aware of them. He has shown both self-control and calmness, as well as steadfastness and steely resolve to rise to the awesome duty that now rests so heavily on him. The measured way he has handled that grim task has reassured me that he understands it only too well and is determined to handle it in the best way possible under the circumstances. So, Deputy Speaker, I am extremely grateful to have had the opportunity to speak briefly to this motion. Many other members of the House still await that opportunity, and in an effort to facilitate that, I simply say that I totally associate myself with the words already spoken by others before me regarding concern for the families of Australians killed or still missing, and about the need for us all to determinedly protect the equal rights of Australian Muslims. The Honourable Member for Melbourne Ports. When we uh, saw those twin towers, icons of American success and diversity collapse, the entire democratic world stood eyeball to eyeball with evil. Mr Deputy Speaker, let us not underestimate the audacity or daring of this attack on the United States 
a close ally and friend of Australia. I hope it's not being too brutally analytical to say that even from the point of view of these, uh, the extremists who perpetrated this deed, a successful operation. That is one of the most frightening aspects of the fact that some hundred people who were involved in this activity for over a year could plan this terrible deed and not a word of it leak. Some of us will have seen last night the frightening interview with Os Osama bin Laden's mentor Khalid Khawaja from CBS that was rebroadcast on uh, 60 Minutes last night where he said that the White House was very vulnerable and uh, could be destroyed at the cost of uh, just a couple of lives. Khawaja claimed that the weakness of the United States was that its people were brought up to avoid death. What would happen if 100,000 people were killed? What would happen if 200,000 were injured, he asked. Mr Peter Harcher in the Financial Review on the weekend took this further. He said, it's, is it clear that bin Laden believes that he will weaken the US resolve to fight by inflicting massive casualties? Is that what lies ahead of us? And those numbers imply something far more lethal than the attacks during the week. They suggest a chemical and biological and perhaps nuclear capacity. Al-Qaeda, the base, is said to have chemical weapons capability. Mr Deputy Speaker, I can't help but fear that this whole operation is very well planned. I can't ignore the fact that the leader of the opposition in Afghanistan, Ahmed Shah Massoud, was killed just at the height of these events. Uh, this, uh, these events that we're entering into, Mr Deputy Speaker, are truly um, a battle, an existential battle, between the democratic world and uh, a, a small group of extremists who uh, envy, hate and despise the modernity, not just of the United States, but all of us who live in our current democratic system. This is not a battle between the United States, Australia, the democratic world and Muslims. That would be a defamation of one of the world's great monothe monotheistic religions. Moreover, we must not conflate the desperate boat refugees who happen to be uh, of Muslim faith uh, with these few extremists. Let us not fall also into the trap of saying that uh, these events in New York and Washington were as the result of some poor people's angst over Western colonialism. This is not a fight over this or that US policy. There is no, this is no justifiable response to American policy in the Middle East. What should our response be? I, I want to echo the words of the American ambassador and my friend, the member for Wills, earlier in, the, in this condolence debate. Our policy ought to be not vengeance, not retaliation, not retribution, not revenge, but rather a cool, calculated and measured policy of self-defence. This ought to inform our response. Lethal force would only be used discriminately to prevent <coughs> these terrorists from triumphing, to prevent these people from doing it again. The US ambassador said in the very moving condolence speech, uh, uh, condolence ceremony that we had, that, that, we, uh, that the United States policy would not be informed by vengeance. I hope uh, the people who heard uh, and were behind all of these events heard all of the people in that room singing the battle hymn of the Republic. To hear an Australian audience singing that so lustily in should inform them that when democratic people are aroused, as we were during the Second World War, uh, we have the ability to respond to the kinds of things that were perpetrated in New York and Washington. Our ethos ought to be the ethos of those very brave three on United Flight 93, Jeremy Glick, Thomas Burnett and uh, James Bingham, who uh, decided that rather than let their plane plough into the into the White House, they would take the terrorists with them. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, I've long been associated with the United States. Uh, I was very pleased of the reaction of people in my electorate who were putting flowers outside the US Consulate General who, have, who participated in a very large service at St Patrick's Cathedral. Uh, sorry, at St Paul's Cathedral. I've had to explain these events to my children. Uh, and all I can say is that we have to have uh, that spirit that Abraham Lincoln talked about, the better angels of our nature to guide our policy in the coming battle with these extremists. Order. The question is the motion moved by the Prime Minister to be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Curtin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On the evening of September 11, as Australians, as we on this side of the world watched in horror the unfolding tale of death and destruction in the United States that morning, we asked ourselves, will anything ever be the same? For the world had changed in those few hours in a way we would never have imagined, never have wished for. Not only has the skyline of Manhattan been altered, so forevermore has the geopolitical landscape. The first telephotos depicted a horrifying spectacle. It was surreal, playing out like a Hollywood movie script or a dreadful novel. On a Tuesday morning, terrorists simultaneously commandeered four passenger aeroplanes laden with fuel and commuters for the long flights from Boston, Newark and Dulles airports across the United States to the West Coast. The hijackers, it seems, took control. Two planes flew directly into the twin towers of the World Trade Center, both structures collapsing within the hour, with thousands trapped. A third plane hit the Pentagon in Washington. The fourth crashed in Pennsylvania, apparently after the passengers, hearing over their mobile phones what had happened in New York, overpowered the terrorists. The awesome, terrifying photographs and film footage have shown us again and again the enormity of these evil, diabolical acts. The cruel conception of these acts has begun to sink in, using domestic, domestic passenger jets as weapons to attack the metropolis of New York and of Washington, killing thousands of people just going about their innocent daily lives. Will anything ever be the same? And now we begin to realise the enormity of the human cost, the loss, the pain, the distress. We will not be able to erase the images from our minds. CNN provides us with a constant, ever-present reminder, real-time, of this tragedy. And as I watch the awful scenes, I'm reminded of some wonderful times I've spent in New York and in Washington with American friends. These are a people and cities that I love. Five years ago, I spent a sabbatical in Boston at Harvard Business School. Our class of 180 comprised students from 30 countries around the world. We came together in the United States to learn from some of the best and brightest talents on business and management and finance, and we developed strong and lasting friendships, our common bond being our learning experience in the United States. I check the Harvard Business School website daily to find any news of any of my colleagues from a number of my classmates worked in the financial district of New York. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm here as the elected representative of the Western Australian electorate of Curtin. There are a number of American citizens living in the beautiful beachside suburbs of Perth, many of whom are with American companies or working in the mining, petroleum and resources industry that provides such an economic base to our state. On behalf of the people of Curtin, I express to all Americans and all those who have been personally affected our sympathy, our support and our friendship at this time of tragedy. A mood has descended over the civilised world, a complexion of grief, of anger, of resolve, of unity. Australia joins the international expressions of solidarity and support and friendship with the United States. As it faces one of its greatest challenges in its proud history, the United States is not alone. I support this motion. Order. The question is that the motion relating to terrorist attacks in the United States of America moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Cornwall. Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker, I also wish to support this resolution. I, just, I will begin by uh, reading a, a letter which I sent uh, on Thursday, the 13th of September, to His Excellency the Ambassador Tom Schaefer. Dear Ambassador Schaefer, 
We wish to express our most heartfelt and sincerest condolences to the people of America. Our prayers, thoughts and hearts are with you in this time of sadness and devastation. Time will mend, but the memories will last a lifetime. As Deputy Chairperson of the Australia-USA Parliamentary Friendship Group and the Federal Member for Cornwall, I wish to extend our deepest sympathies. I would like to take this time to say that our thoughts and prayers are going out to the victims and their families and to all Americans. We have all been deeply affected by this horrific series of events. I have no doubt that the perpetrators of this heinous crime will be brought to justice. Our hopes are for a fast recovery to restore your nation with its sense of freedom and security. It is obvious that all of America is joining in the spirit of togetherness and solidarity in engendering a full recovery. Warm regards, Andrew Theophanes. Mr Deputy Speaker, as many have said, this is a very solemn and sad occasion. We have um, a situation unparalleled in modern history in terms of destruction of innocent people by the deliberate hand um, of people acting with motives unknown but with obviously uh, very evil motivations in terms of what they were doing. We have a situation where um, totally innocent people working in um, the World Trade Center and in the Pentagon were attacked and killed. Thousands of people given no chance whatever and their whole, not only they killed but all of the, their relatives and friends who have to bear the suffering of the consequences of what has happened. Obviously we sympathise with the, the, the friends and relatives but we sympathise more generally with the American people in this situation. A lot has been said about the possible perpetrators of this act. I understand that at this very moment pressure is being put on the Taliban regime to deliver uh, Osama bin Laden to um, the proper authorities so that he can be uh, questioned and, if necessary, tried for these crimes. I think that's very important that the Taliban regime do this. But I think we should also reflect on the fact that the Taliban regime itself has been guilty of acts of violence and terror against its own civilians and, as such, has also perpetrated crimes against humanity. For some time I have been talking about the um, horrible situation that ordinary Afghani people face under that regime. And I want to say that pressure should be brought on not merely for the delivery of that particular terrorist but also for changes in terms of human rights and the behaviour of that regime. I would myself prefer if that re regime were removed from power. But if not, at least big changes in the way they are approaching their citizens and their situation. Now, it's very important in this context to look at the last clause in the motion and ensure that people of different backgrounds are not in a situation where they, including people of Muslim background, uh, become innocent victims in this situation of necessary punishment for those who have carried out this terrible crime. So um, let me conclude by saying I think it's very important, in particular, that those refugees who have escaped from the Taliban regime should not be punished in any way 
because they are the people who are protesting against that very same regime that has been harbouring the terrorists. Let's uh, not confuse one thing with the other. Let's not confuse the refugees with um, the awful Taliban regime and other supporters of the terror that has occurred in the United States. Order. The Honourable Member Fisher, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Finance and Administration. Mr Deputy Speaker, try as I might, there is nothing that I can say or do to change the events or bring back the thousands of people who died uh, in the United States of America last Thursday. What I can do, however, is to offer heartfelt condolences and support on behalf of all of those living in my electorate of Fisher and the Sunshine Coast of Queensland more generally. Many of us uh, often bemoan the Americanisation of our culture, the way that our music, sport, language and even eating habits have been modified to so closely reflect those of the USA. It is at times like this, however, that we stop and realise that it is more than culture which binds our two nations together. As Australians, we look to the United States for support and security in times of need. We also look to them as a nation that upholds our values of democracy and freedom, of peace and goodwill. His Excellency Thomas J. Schaefer, the American ambassador at the service this morning, uh, outlined this very well in one of the most moving speeches I have ever heard. Together with the United States, Australia is one of a tiny handful of countries to remain totally democratic throughout the entirety of the 20th century. Our two nations have fought side by side in every major conflict of the last century and we have together sought to help other nations uphold the values and freedoms we are so privileged to enjoy. It is for this reason that I and so many others have been so deeply touched by the images of devastation and destruction that have come out of New York and Washington. The terrorists may have hit their targets, but they will never achieve their goals. They will never hold the world to ransom and they will never dent the fabric of the American people. When I rose to sing the Star Spangled Banner in the memorial service this morning, I could not help but think of the particular significance of this anthem at this time. On September 12 and 13, 1814, nearly 187 years to the day of the terrorist attack, a part-time poet by the name of Francis Scott Key wrote of his relief in seeing the US flag still flying after a vicious bombardment by the British. Imprisoned on the frigate Surprise through the nights of the 12th and 13th, Key struggled to catch glimpses of the star-shaped Fort McHenry adorned with its huge flag, 42 feet long, with eight red stripes, seven white stripes and 15 white stars. In the dark of the night of the 13th, when the shelling suddenly stopped, Key could not tell whether the British had been defeated or the fort had fallen. As the sun began to rise, Key used the back of an envelope to pen the first lines of a poem he called Defence of Fort McHenry. When the sun rose and following his intense relief and pride at seeing the fort had withstood the onslaught, Key finished his poem by writing, "'Tis the st star-spangled banner, O long may it wave, or the land of the free and the home of the brave." In the last few days, we all witnessed this same pride as the American people so bravely draped their flag from the Pentagon <coughs> and on the site of the former Trade Centre building in New York. These touching images speak volumes about the strength of the American people and their determination to ensure good triumphs over bad. Francis Scott Key could not have imagined the profound and symbolic influence his words would have on democracy nor the way, 187 years later, they would help bind the American people together in their greatest time of need. Day in, day out, we hear new stories from the US that make us all realise how precious life is and how nothing in life can be taken for granted. 
As Americans struggle to come to terms with their grief and their shock, and as they unite under their flag and through the strength of national pride, we can be sure of one thing. We can be sure the star-spangled banner will continue to wave, and that irrespective of what some terrorists might think and do, America will continue to be a land of the free, a home of the brave and an inspiration to us all. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Lowe. Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the people of Lowe, whom I represent, I stand here tonight to express my support for this motion and to convey my deep and heartfelt sympathy to all those families from all parts of the world who lost loved ones last Tuesday and to the people of the United States of America. Mr Speaker, following this horrible attack on our freedom, we anticipate military retaliation. However, we must secure a permanent solution. Mr Speaker, Deputy Speaker, I believe that the solution is found in preserving freedom. Freedom is the very essence of our jurisprudence, the doctrine of universalism, that belief that holds that every person is as valuable as another, that every person has the same intrinsic value. Mr Deputy Speaker, Charles Rice, in his 50 questions and answers on the natural law, is cited with this simple but profound quote, jurisprudence kills people. Mr Deputy Speaker, for in jurisprudence flows the moral and legal justification for much that is done in the name of good and evil. Sadly, we know there are people in the world that believe that different human beings are of varying significance or worth, depending upon their culture or their faith. They are the same people capable of hijacking four jet aircraft and sacrificing themselves and others in order to kill yet many more thousands of innocent people. Mr Deputy Speaker, we can only imagine what was in the hijackers' minds when they carried out this terrible act. There can be no moral reasoning or any justification for anyone to perpetrate such evil. In the short term, we support the invocation of the ANZUS Treaty. However, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the long term, we must secure freedom. Every man, woman and child in Australia must be educated to know that we are all human beings. No religious or political ideology can ever be licit if it condones moral or cultural relativism. A regime that says, I may treat another person differently merely because they are of a certain religion, race, sex or so forth. Any ideology, Mr Deputy Speaker, that advocates moral or cultural relativism is anathema to democracy and an affront to freedom itself. Sadly, there are some on this earth who prescribe to relativist beliefs. Those who flew those four planes full of innocent victims, killing many more in the process, believed that what they were doing was right and moral. They believed that they were acting with moral sanction. Mr Deputy Speaker, we in Australia and governments around the world must make it our mission to proclaim freedom and the universalist principle of intrinsic human value in each person. If we do not convince Australia's children of this basic truth, then our children will grow to become vulnerable to ideology that may value certain human beings differently. United today, we condemn the violence perpetrated on the innocent. We condemn the violence against humanity. We are deeply saddened by the horrific loss of life. Mr Deputy Speaker, Australia has an obligation to proclaim the truth of universalism and denounce and condemn the lies of anyone who would say one person is less valuable than another and less deserving of the minimal standards of dignity. Let us be brave and stand for what is right and condemn what is wrong, for relativism is a lie. There is right and there is wrong. In the defence of freedom, it is our duty to hold to higher values so that we positively discriminate against wrong and support right. 
In defending freedom, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm fortified by the words of the Anglican Bishop of Sydney South Region, His Grace Robert Forsyth, whom I heard say yesterday that our Christian faith teaches us not to be afraid. Mr Deputy Speaker, I too say to this House tonight, be not afraid. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the Honourable Member for Cook. Mr Deputy Speaker, the year was 1964 when I first visited New York, along with my uh, new wife, on our honeymoon at the ripe age of 22. We both, my wife and I both fell in love with the city, its pace, its style, its heady belief in itself and the rhythm of life which seemed to imbue the very pavements. The Metropolitan Museum, the Guggenheim, the Chrysler Building, the Empire State, Central Park, Grand Central, Fifth Avenue, St Patrick's Cathedral, Broadway, the Statue of Liberty were great icons that we delighted in visiting. In 1977, I returned as the Australian Trade Commissioner to New York. To the list of New York icons was added the Twin Towers of the World Trade Centre. I visited there many times to visit Australian exporters and particularly the Australian Meat and Livestock Corporation, which was based there. I took off from a helicopter on top of the World Trade Centre and uh, visited, uh, flew around uh, Manhattan. It is, uh, as someone who lived there and, and uh, loved living there, it was uh, a tremendous sorrow when I, with the events unfolded uh, last Tuesday night. We have an, a number of American friends we had difficulty f uh, phoning through. When we rang some close friends, they were in absolute uh, despair uh, because their only son uh, was missing uh, down close to the World Trade Center. It was not until some 12 hours later that he emerged from the rubble, and they were absolutely thrilled and delighted to see him. We have seen, in terms of the events that unfolded last week, the unleashing of evil in the world. There is no doubt that we have seen it. We have seen its face. We have seen its reality. We have seen the despair uh, of humanity as they respond to the unfolding events in New York. Our sympathies go out to the people of the USA, and particularly those who live in New York, the bright uh, and dynamic people who inhabit uh, Manhattan, who make much of the world's uh, economic cycle go round. And we condemn terrorism in all its forms that occurred at this time to produce such a loss of humanity such as we have never seen in our lifetime before outside of the world wars. We stand shoulder to shoulder with the USA in terms of this, at this time of immense trial, recognise the goodness that is in much of the American people to understand the humanity that they explore, which they show to the rest of the world, and to see this perpetrated on them is even more of a calamity. And in, in terms of our debt to the American people and uh, their traditions, uh, and their values, we think particularly uh, of, the, of the Battle of the Coral Sea War. As somebody who was born uh, during the war years, that I remember my parents talking of the, the, debt, the great debt that we owed to the American people, and people of my generation understand that. We share similar values. We share a sense of vision, and we also share a sense of faith. And it is this sense of faith that draws us together, that gives us hope. In, this very, in these very dark hours. I noticed a common theme in terms of with the national prayer breakfast being held here and as people this very day. And as people reflected on the events of the last week, that they talked about the light that was shining in terms of the darkness and in terms of those who have faith can turn to this light. And at the same time that we look in terms of, uh, with sympathy to the Muslim community in terms of uh, the very prejudice that's been enacted towards them. And we also recognise that this is a result of absolute fanatics. And I think at the same time it gives us some recognition as to why so many people have escaped from Afghanistan, why we've seen them launch themselves on boats, and why they want to es escape the Taliban in all its uh, unseemly, horrific nature. And so that uh, in terms of in my electorate, which is basically an Anglo-Celtic one, uh, that there is enormous shock at what has happened. But at the same time, we need to reach out to those who are subject to the prejudice 
and say that you and I together are Australians and we will, we will move forward together. But it's appropriate that we recognise our great indebtedness to the United States to remind them that we stand shoulder to shoulder with them. We extend our sympathies in this horrific disaster that we all watch unfold and uh, extend uh, for the future that great hope will come from this uh, uh, amazing disaster. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Perth. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the motion and associate myself unreservedly with the remarks of the Leader of the Opposition and the Prime Minister. The human tragedy that we have witnessed over the last week has touched the hearts of many Australians. Whether we watched these terrorist attacks unfold on television late on Tuesday night, as I did, or saw the consequences of them over the course of the last few days, Australians are struggling to come to terms with what many perceive as a new world, a world in which terrorism can strike no matter who you are or where you live. While this was unquestionably an attack aimed at the United States, it was also an attack on all citizens of the world. While citizens of the United States will rank first in the final casualty list, people from around the world have died or are missing, many Australians among them the most Australians, casualties in fact, from a single event outside of war. These people were attacked regardless of their nationality, their colour, their creed or religion. These people were singled out for no good reason other than that they were in the wrong buildings or on the wrong plane at the wrong time. This was not just an attack on the United States in peacetime, it was an indiscriminate attack on fundamental human decency. As a result, the perpetrators of these crimes should not be punished because of where they come from or the religion, if any, they believe in nor should we punish others simply because they live where they live or whom they worship. To do that would be to repeat the crime against humanity these terrorists have already committed. Rather, these people should be punished because they have committed these crimes against humanity. Australians want no part in the world that devalues human life in this way and repudiate these crimes absolutely. But we also know that we have to deal with the consequences that flow from these tragic events. Many Australians are now deeply worried about what will come next. While I'm sure that we all support and understand the right and need of the United States to respond to these unprovoked attacks, many of us are also concerned about what that response will mean for the future. We are concerned that other innocent people, no matter where they live, may intentionally or unintentionally become victims of a maelstrom soon to be unleashed. Conflict is never something to be sought. Regrettably, justice dictates that it cannot always be avoided. The decision to invoke Articles 4 and 5 of the ANZUS Treaty is the only re re appropriate response in this time of crisis. It reinforces the awesome and sombre responsibilities that must be faced by governments and parliaments at these times. It also reminds us how Australians across the generations have been prepared to secure what is fair and what is right, not just for Australians for Australians, but in defence of the values we hold dear. Australians, whether at home or abroad, know that this is a conflict that will not be contained through traditional fields of battle. The perpetrators who committed these acts of terrorism clearly are not concerned that innocent people, whether they be Australians or people living in their own communities, may become the victims of their crimes. But despite the great weight of responsibility and inevitable sense of unease that I believe we all have in considering our response to this tragedy, this is the time for us all to say enough is enough. If there is such a thing as a just conflict, then the proportion and targeted response currently being planned by, by the United States is surely that. In that context, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to recommend to all Australians the remarks of Ambassador Scheifer in the Great Hall Parliament House today. I would like to read into the record some of those uh, remarks. Ambassador Scheifer said this. Yesterday, as so many others did, I sought the comfort of a higher being. I'm a Presbyterian by faith, but I felt as the American ambassador it was important to remember that God is worshipped in many places and ways. I attended a Catholic mass, an Anglican service, and visited a Jewish study centre. At the end of the day, I visited with the Imam of the Canberra Mosque. In each place, I felt the presence of God. In each place I looked into the faces of men and women who shared our pain, shared our horror, shared our disgust at the monstrous act that had been committed. It is important for all of us to remember that just as Hitler was no Christian, those who have committed these acts were not men and women of faith. No Christian, no Jew, no Muslim would have done such a thing. The common thread that runs through these three great faiths is that love must conquer hate, good must defeat evil. Ambassador Scheifer then wanted to say, Americans are not a vengeful people. Our nation is founded on the principles of liberty and justice. We are free to choose our faith, free to choose our creed, free to choose the means that will comfort our souls and the souls of others. No, we are not a vengeful people, but we are a people who love justice. We will not strike out the innocent. We will not end the lives of good men and good women for no good reason. 
We will find those responsible for this dastardly deed and we will bring them to justice. Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend the motion to the House. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the Honourable Member for Pearce. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Along with many other Australians over this last few days, my thoughts and prayers have been with the people of the United States, uh, to the families and friends of uh, many people from the international community, and to the families and friends of those Australians who perished or who have not yet been found. Like many Australians, I was deeply saddened and horrified as I watched the terrible tragedy unfold. The incredible acts of bravery by those trying to save others stand in stark contrast to this terrible uh, act of terrorism. Acts of terrorism have concerned deeply the international community now for some time. Many countries, including some of those that embrace Islam, whose citizens have felt the effects of terrorism, have vowed to do everything possible to stop these premeditated acts of barbarity. So I suppose in the midst of uh, this terrible act and the tragedy that it brings upon so many, it's a time for all nations to renew their commitment to preventing terrorism and it's a time to reflect on the conditions that give rise to but never excuse such extreme acts. It's a time to commit to putting an end to poverty and prejudice in all its forms that gives rise to hatred and bitterness that so divides many countries of the world and many people of the world. And it's time to commit to doing everything possible to, pre to prevent such an act from ever occurring again. As a representative of the people of the electorate of Pierce in Western Australia, I express our deepest sympathy to all those affected by this terrible event and in particular to Ambassador Schaefer and to the people of the United States of America and to those who continue to search for people who've perished and who search in hope for those who may have survived. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the Honourable Member for Fowler. Mr Deputy Speaker, I join with other members of this House in extending my deepest sympathy to those who have lost family and friends in the tragic acts of terrorism in the United States. Shortly before midnight Sydney time last Tuesday, I was awoken by my son calling me to come and see the news pictures from the United States. Like the millions of others who watched that night or saw the replays the next day, my reaction was disbelief. Nearly a week later, the shock of this atrocity is still sinking in. What it means for the world and for Australia is still hard to say for certain. As we go about our daily tasks, we can't help thinking of those thousands of innocent people in the World Trade Centre going about their daily tasks when suddenly their lives were cruelly ended. Our certainty and confidence has been shattered. We no longer feel safe in our own homes and workplaces. We are targets of an enemy without morals or feelings. An enemy who does not wear a uniform but hides among us. An enemy whose numbers are small but whose effect is widespread. While Australia has thankfully been spared all but a few major acts of terrorism, the events in New York and Washington have shown us how vulnerable we are. If New York and indeed the Pentagon can be attacked, how open are we to attack? The world now awaits the wrath of the mightiest military machine ever assembled. We may identify and deal with those behind the attacks. But will that mean the end of terrorism? I think not. How can we deal with it in the long term? What kind of people, what mother's sons can carry out such an attack? We can point the finger at an individual as the one responsible, but does that answer the question of what drives an individual with no regard for human life, least of all their own? Someone said to me the other day, Mr Deputy Speaker, we should introduce the death penalty for suicide bombers. That's about the level of understanding of what we know about terrorism. Anyone who has visited a refugee camp in the Middle East, as I and other members of this House have, anyone who has felt the despair 
of people living in the same camps where their grandparents were born would know that it's not hard to recruit people willing to die for a cause. If you think that one evil individual is behind all acts of terrorism, then you've been reading too many Superman comics. When you ask the question, what makes a leader, terrorist or otherwise, the answer is followers. But what makes followers? What drives people to give their own lives? What leads them to destroy human life, including their own? It can't be money. It can only be hate. So, along with those who recruit, train and direct terrorists, we must also accuse those who incite hatred of being responsible for acts of terror. And those who incite hatred are not limited to one religion. In the past few days, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have been alarmed by reported incidents of terror against Muslims in Australia. There are reports of the attempted firebombing of a mosque. In my own electorate of Fowler, I have heard reports of Muslim women being spat upon and having scarves torn from their heads. Now, if you think that's trivial, can you imagine a Catholic nun, a Catholic nun having her scarf torn from her head? We have seen students of Arabic origin verbally abused on a university campus. These are acts of hatred. They are acts of terror. They are minor by comparison with the events of New York and Washington, but they must also be condemned. Until we realise that terrorism breeds on hatred and bigotry, until we realise that these faults are not limited to one religion, we will not be free from the threat of terrorism. In the coming years, our banks will probably spend more on security than it would cost to relieve third world debt. Our security services will intrude more and more into our privacy, but we will still be vulnerable. Until we come to terms with the causes of terrorism, until we learn that hatred and those who preach hatred do, do so, not only for, from minarets but also from our radio stations, until we condemn hatred in all its forms, we can only expect terrorism to continue. And the thousands who died in the United States last week will have died in vain. The question is that the motion proposed by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the Honourable the Minister for Aged Care. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the motion moved by the Prime Minister and join others in extending condolences to the American nation and to the families and loved ones of the individuals who are lost. The end of the Cold War brought us a sense of elation. We talked of a peace dividend, that we could relax our vigilance to ensure freedom. We, the thought was abroad that the world would be safer, and yet a decade later, in the new century, one great threat is replaced by an even greater one. Here in Australia, our innocent belief that we in Australia are free from danger is now undone. As we mourn with the American people and look to the way forward, it must be with a new sense of reality. The world has changed. Our vigilance must return. Forty nations have lost citizens, 5,000 people missing. Some 80 Australians could be lost. And that to the jubilation of those who are committed to a fanatical cause who pursue it ruthlessly and are incapable of ever being persuaded otherwise, either by reason, compassion or indeed any sentiment related to human understanding. Hitler was committed to his vision of the Third Reich and the removal of all and any that did not fit his vision. These terrorists who rejoice in their destruction, the destruction they perpetrated in New York, in Washington and Pennsylvania, will similarly target and destroy anyone that hinders their ideal. They are Hitler's brothers, bound in evil. The way forward requires leadership and action guided by wisdom, courage and determination. But answered, this terror must be. By invoking Articles 4 and 5 of the ANZUS Treaty, Australia shows once again that we answer the call every time to fight for freedom. We will join with our allies, the United States of America, to combat those who wantonly kill to serve their fanatical purpose. 
Ours is a friendship, Australia and the United States, forged through adversity and joy. Adversity when the freedom of men and women is threatened and joy when peace is attained. May President Bush have wisdom in his deliberations and strength in his leadership. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the Honourable Member for Oxley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to support the words of the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition in the condolence motion put forward today. I first begin by offering the people of America my deepest sympathy and sorrow for the victims of the tragedy that took place on September 11, 2001. To the families, the friends, the children, members of the firefighting family, the police and the emergency service workers, and to all those ordinary people that went to help others, I want to express on behalf of the electorate of Oxley uh, condolence for the terrible loss of life. The reach of pain from this terrible crime will be felt all over the world and not less will it be felt here in Australia. There are still some 80 Australians that remain unaccounted for, presumed now dead. Many Australian families will be directly touched and many will be indirectly touched by the loss of so many innocent lives. One life that I knew personally was that of Andrew Knox. While I have not seen Andrew for quite some years, uh, his memory is still with me and the loss of his life is a great tragedy, great tragedy not only for uh, for all of us, and it must be a great time of pain and suffering for his family. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the world will never be the same again. Many have said this over the past week. It could not be more true. For never has there been a terrorist crime as devastating or as calculated to strike at the heart of innocent people than the attack on the buildings in New York and Washington and the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania. While these attacks were committed on the American people, these attacks were also committed on all the people of the world. The victims of this cowardly attack were of all colours, of all races, of creed, of all walks of life. They were young, they were old, they were Christian, they were Jewish and they were Muslim. But most disturbing, they were all innocent of any crime and merely going about their normal lives. The, Im the pictures and images that we saw beamed to us live from the United States will live with us forever. And before our very eyes, we saw the brutality and the evil that is terrorism. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I said, all our lives have been changed forever and nothing from here will ever be the same again. But from here, there is a great task ahead for the American people and for the Australian people. The perpetrators of this horrendous crime must be found and they must be punished and they must be brought to justice. The United States and the American President George Bush, Bush have reacted with incredible strength and with incredible courage. The people of America will not be deterred or damaged by this evil act, nor will the people of the world. I offer my support, my sympathy, my sorrow and my prayers for all those that lost their lives. And I know that the spirit of freedom and democracy will never be damaged by, by the material world because it is built not on concrete and steel but built on courage and on unity. At this time, in our greatest hour of need, um, I offer all of my sympathy and sorrow to the American people. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the Honourable Minister for Community Services. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I certainly um, uh, support the motion and pass on uh, not only my condolences, but to those of the people of Richmond. The terrorism attack on the United States has touched all of us, some directly and most of the world indirectly. Because of this senseless act of terrorism, the world will never be the same again. The United States is rebuilding, both physically and emotionally, and Australia is playing a role in that rebuilding. Earlier today, along with most of those here today, and many others, I attended a memorial service for the victims of the attack in the United States in the Great Hall of the Parliament. It was a moving and uniting service, Mr Speaker, and we can do, as we can do so little in the face of such a barbaric tragedy. While America considers its next course of action, Australia too have united to support the United States in this their hour of greatest need. But we must not forget 
that this tragedy has touched this country too, with so far unknown a number of Australian lives lost in this terrorism attack. Even in my own electorate of Richmond, there are several cases of miraculous escapes from death from people who were quite literally in the wrong place at the wrong time. The brothers of a Bangalore resident, Bird Jensen, was in the World Trade Centre when the first plane hit the building. Fortunately, he survived. A young man from Byron Bay, Michael Angersley, witnessed the attack from a Manhattan apartment block he was staying in. And a member of my own staff spent a frantic Tuesday trying to find his father missing after the attacks in Manhattan. Again, fortunately, he was safe. Australia has already pledged its support to the United States in whatever shape that help is needed. Australia has always stood firmly behind its allies. It's their time of need, and this certainly is no exception. Today I also attended a prayer breakfast in the Parliament House to give our spiritual support to the victims of this senseless tragedy. And we all prayed that God give us the strength to come to terms with what happened last Tuesday and to try to understand this terrible, terrible evil. May I now reaffirm and repeat a call I made at the breakfast for all of us to join together against evil to make this world a better place for all of us to live in. I support the motion. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Newcastle. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, like yourself, on Tuesday night I was at a, at a function in Singapore hosted by the, the Speaker of the Singapore Parliament when my wife managed to get a phone call through to me to tell me what was happening on the, on the TV screen, what she was seeing on the TV screens back home. And uh, the uh, events from there um, took on a sameness to some events almost or just over 10 years ago following the earthquake in Newcastle, one of those cataclysmic events that, that do so much damage and are so bewildering, but also have a capacity to, to unite people across, in that case, in the earthquake case, across a community and of course in, with the World Trade Centre across the world because the people who were affected and impacted by that, uh, by that act w were in fact from virtually every major nation in the world, including our, our own. It's also um, formed a combination in this parliament where, where all of us are supporting a resolution uh, which is not a very common occurrence as we all understand, but these events are so, are so extraordinary. Uh, that uh, so as to warrant such a course of action. And I suppose, in a sense, that old saying about challenges, uh, and, this, and these are very challenging times, but, but challenges are also opportunities. And there is now an opportunity, I think, and which is uh, beholden upon on the, the world leadership, uh, America, Europe, uh, our country and, and other interested countries, to, to try and differentiate between those who caused this act and their fellow human beings. And I think what I'm seeing in my office in terms of the phone calls and, and emails I've been receiving in recent days, which lumps all Muslims together, is, is in a way is more dangerous an act than, than the act of terrorism in itself. And uh, it really is a time for that challenge to differentiate and to, to help the world to understand that the people who perpetrate these kind of activities don't belong to any mainstream religion in that normal sense that we'd understand. Um, that they're outcasts within their own community in a particular in a particular kind of sense, as the Prime Minister said this afternoon in quoting uh, Sir Winston Churchill. But the challenge for all of us is to be able to differentiate and to help explain to our community that in the same way that these events can unify, uh, whether, whether it be the people of Newcastle after an earthquake, the people of America following this uh, this event, or the people of the world, and particularly our country, by finding and understanding the depth of it and the opportunity available to explain that our strength comes in our unity, our strength comes in our cohesion, our strength, uh, our strength comes from us talking to each other and understanding and working for similar objectives. Today the parliament set a standard for the rest of the country. Uh, if we can unify, then surely our community can. And I'd ask those in the community who wanted to cast blame and and to scapegoat and to call for extreme actions on, on innocent people to understand that won't help. Uh, in fact, if anything, it, 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 it's almost as great an evil as the act of, of terrorism itself. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's an important resolution and I'm, it's one that I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to enjoin. I just uh, regret the fact that uh, you and I together last week um, were exposed to the need for us to do this. And, uh, but I therefore commend the, 
the, the motion to the House and, and to the public at large. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. The Honourable Member for New England. Deputy Speaker, I rise also on behalf of the people of New England uh, to support this motion before the House and also to support the comments made by the Prime Minister of Australia and the Leader of the Opposition in this place today. Uh, the shocking events of last week uh, will go down in my memory as amongst the worst that I've ever been privy to. And it started, Mr Deputy Speaker, with a phone call uh, from my youngest son, who just turned 19, who at the moment is overseas in London. And he rang fairly early in the morning, and I was not aware of the uh, devastation that had been wreaked upon the United States. And he told me on the phone, and I at first uh, I didn't believe him. And it was only through his pressing for me to go and turn the television on in the early hours of the morning that I realised the horror uh, that was being perpetrated against the people of the United States. But something else uh, I noticed, Mr Deputy Speaker, and that was the fear uh, that was in the voice of my uh, youngest son, and obviously a fear that is around the world in that generation. Uh, the innocence that was there for anyone born after the 1970s or early 1970s is gone and it's gone forever. And I think as the day unfolded and the horror uh, that was being um, again committed against the innocent men and women and children of the United States um, has passed on through now to the little children. I noticed in my visits around the electorate uh, during the rest of that week uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, as I went to many, many schools, that there was also fear and questions in children as young as five and six, and it was reiterated in their drawings that they were doing for their teachers. And I think uh, all of us have been overwhelmed through uh, what has happened. On Saturday night I was listening to a, a guest speaker in Tenterfield who uh, by chance had spent a large amount of his time on behalf of the World Bank and many others uh, working uh, in Afghanistan. And he hoped that the act of war would also be complemented with an act of development and also used the terms, which I think describes it quite well, of these terrorists without principle, that they were mad dogs with insane minds. And I think coming from the country in particular, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, when you goad something as hard as it's been, you realise that there is a mindless attitude that takes over. And when one has seen uh, on the television so dramatically those shots, as I say, I don't think anyone uh, shall forget it. Again, I repeat on behalf of the people of New England our heartfelt sorrow, uh, our full support and the fact that, as Australians, we will stand by our friends in the United States of America. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Griffith. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. The motion before the House has my wholehearted support and the support of the people of Brisbane, who I represent in this parliament. The motion sets out three things. It expresses our support for the extraordinary experience of suffering which the people of America have gone through these last days. It conveys the grave news that for the first time in the 50-year history of our security arrangement with the United States, we have operationalized our security alliance with them. And thirdly, Mr Deputy Speaker, it contains within it the complete expression of the will and the resolve of this parliament to act with the United States to meet the common danger. When we speak of America, Mr Deputy Speaker, we speak of a democracy, we speak of a vibrant economy, we speak of the world's last remaining superpower. America is proud of its tradition as the arsenal of democracy, to paraphrase Roosevelt's great speech of the war. We know of its economy, the generator of world economic growth, that which has kept much of this region afloat in the period since the Asian financial crisis hit. But when we think of the United States as a superpower, it is worth reflecting on the history of superpowers in the history of this planet. We had Pax Romana, we had Pax Britannica. We have had a range of powers in the history of humankind which have dominated this planet, 
But rarely have we had a power such as we've had with the United States, which exercised its supreme power so benignly, when it had copious opportunities to do the reverse. Had any other power been the United States in 1945, what would it have done? The opportunity for world domination available to the United States at that time was immense. Had the political predisposition do so, it did not. It did not because of its cherished democratic traditions. The United States faced a similar opportunity in 1991 with the collapse of the world's other remaining superpower, the Soviet Union. Yet once again, the United States did not seek world domination, though it possessed the power to do so. And if we reflect on the exercise of power, both political and military, in the history of humankind, it is almost unique, in fact it is unique, that a power which possesses such unsurpassed military predominance chooses not to use it and instead chooses to extend benefit to the rest of humanity. The motion expresses our feelings of solidarity with the American people at this time, our feelings of common humanity as we have seen firsthand through our television screens the extraordinary, car extraordinary carnage in both Washington and in New York. That sight of carnage has touched deeply people across the entire civilised world. People in Brisbane have been on the telephone to me as their local member of parliament asking how could anyone do this to another human being. I had this, this afternoon a, an email message from a Mr Joe McLeod of Carindale in my electorate of Brisbane expressing thanks that simply I, on behalf of the community in that part of Brisbane, had proposed sending an open letter of support to the people of America at this time of their profound national need and crisis. Expressing our common humanity with our American friends at this time is important. It is important, I believe, in terms of the execution of the process of grieving. The second thing which the motion before the House does is to operationalise the relevant clauses of the ANZUS Alliance. This, as I noted before, Mr Deputy Speaker, is unique in the history of our security relationship with the United States. Despite the range of crises we have met together in the period since 1951, the clauses, the operational clauses of this alliance have never been put to effect. It is of enormous import that the parliament so resolves to put them into effect and support the action of the executive government of Australia in so doing. The third and final thing which this motion does, Mr Deputy Speaker, is it commits through this parliament our resources, those of the Commonwealth of Australia, to meet the common danger with the United States that we now confront, and that danger is global terrorism. The actions we saw on September 11 mark a turning point in human history. They make a, mark a turning point in the history of international relations. They make a, mark a turning point in terms of how one nation deals with another. We have not just turned a page. We have closed one chapter and we've begun, we have begun a new chapter. What that chapter contains has not been written, but we must reflect as we embark upon that chapter Order, a simple proposition, if good men are silent, then evil will prevail. Has expired. The question is that the motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Boothby. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is hard to add something new after all the millions of words that have been written um, on this uh, terrorist act and um, all the excellent speeches that have already been made on this motion. I fully endorse this motion. Um, what I want to speak about um, is uh, what this motion means to me in terms of uh, what it means for the United States, um, what the action means and uh, what it means for ANZUS. During the voyages of the uh, Puritans the, who first settled America, the first great American, John Winthrop, in a shipboard sermon described their task. He said, we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. It was a far-reaching statement. Over four centuries, this has remained America's mission. It runs deep in their culture and underpins American leadership. It is why they were targeted. It is why we should stand with them. I believe, given a goal, America will not fail. We will never forget September 11, 2001. In the future, we may see the last 12 years as a golden summer when we came out of the shadow of the Cold War and when we were before the bombing of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. There is no event in my life which comes close to this evil, indiscriminate act. Um, events of my parents' generation 
uh, the bombings of, of Dresden and Hiroshima, they were different. They occurred during war. They were not televised live. The United States has long recognised the challenge they face from the asymmetric warfare terrorists wage. But who would have believed that the instruments of commerce, commercial airlines and skyscrapers could be turned into a weapon of mass destruction against New York and Washington? Last week's attack was not an attack on only Washington and New York. It was an attack on citizens of the world. It was an, an, an attack on our way of life. The terrorist network, which subscribes to a hateful interpretation of the Quran, should be, as has been said this week, smoked out and ripped up. This will not be like the Gulf War. It will be a sophisticated, unconventional response that will be required. It will require patience and determination. America is a familiar society to Australians. Children can recognise uh, fire hydrants, New York police. Um, we know about New York's finest. We know about New York's bravest. American values are similar to Australian values. We're a New World country with strong, unbroken democratic traditions. In December 1941, Britain, Australia and the US were hit by a common enemy. At that time, the United, we looked to the United States. They came to our aid. Um, in America's hour of need, we must help them to the best of our abilities. The Honourable Member for Greenway. Mr Speaker, I rise on this occasion to also offer my condolence and the condolence of the electors of Greenway to the families of the victims and to the uh, people of the United States of America. The tragic events of September the 11th will never be forgotten by anybody who believes in freedom and tolerance. These events have touched us all. On Tuesday and Wednesday last week, I had the privilege of presenting a number of certificates to local volunteers for their work in the community. On Wednesday, a number of these volunteers were Red Cross workers from Western Sydney. We learnt that on that day that one of their Red Cross colleagues was aboard one of the hijacked planes. I believe that the events of September the 11th will be a defining moment in the history of our world. How we respond to this tragedy will mark the direction of our society for decades, maybe even centuries. Will we spiral into barbarism and war with attacks and retaliation, or will we as a society rise above that endless violence and vicious circle? George Bush has said that this is the first war of the new millennium. Do we then fight it the same old way as we did last century, or do we find a new path? That is the dilemma that we face today. Is it possible to find a new path, or will the old hatreds and prejudices prevent us? Certainly those responsible must be brought to book, must be held accountable, and they must be punished. But we cannot allow the response to be indiscriminate. Too many innocent uh, civilian lives have been cut short already. Fatalism is all in its, all its forms, religious or politics, leads only down the path of bloodshed and, re and revenge. An eye for an eye leaves only the blind and the angry. The task ahead of us to find a balance, we must deal with the anger that boils inside us, but we must deal with it in a way that will not lead to the spiral of violence and the loss of more innocent lives. This was an attack not only on the nation of America, but also on the beliefs and ideas that underpin our society freedom and tolerance. A fanatic cares nothing for either. These ideas and beliefs also underpin our society, and we as a nation have also lost citizens. Therefore, this was only an attack on Australia, but on every other country who have suffered the loss of their nationals or believe, as we do, in freedom and tolerance. If we do not find a new path away from the spiral of violence, then the terrorists will have won. He who strikes with anger in his heart will be damned. Robert Kennedy, in a speech to the University of Cape Town in South Africa in 1966, said, Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustices, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and, crossing each other from a million different centres of energy and daring, these ripples build a current that can sweep down the, the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend the motion to the House. The Honourable Member for Cowper. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker.